Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm beginning a brand new series teaching about the life of Joseph. And I tell you, this has made a major impact in my life, and I think that this is really going to be powerful for you. You know, I've got this little introductory book that's only about 50 pages, Introduction to the Lessons from Joseph. And then we have this 200-plus page book. And uh, we are making this one available free of charge. We'll send this to you, whether you send anything or not. This one, we're asking for a donation, but we also uh, don't specify exactly how much. We have a suggested donation, but I encourage you to get this full book. This teaching on Joseph is powerful. We also have USB that has the audio and video, or you can get just a DVD or a CD, and we'll be giving out all of that information at the end of the program today. Let me turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and share this with you out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. It says, Now these things were our examples, and it's talking about all of the Old Testament stories that were written. These things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all of these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So verses 6 through 11 here is saying that all of these things written in the Old Testament were written down for our admonition so that we can learn through them. And you know, it's my experience that most of the people I encounter they are going through life and trying to figure things out just all on their own. And, uh, you know, if you do that, in a sense, you're like a pinball that's just launched, you know, and it just bumps into things and bounces around, and there's no aim, there's no direction. And this is how most people live their life. They're like water. They just go with the flow. They seek the lowest level, the path of least resistance. And I tell you, if that's your mindset, if you are just you know, being propelled through life and you are not sitting in the driver's seat and controlling and have a purpose and a direction for your life, I can guarantee you, you are going to crash and burn. Many of you can say amen by experience. You've already been there. And this is how most people learn things is through the school of hard knocks. But those scriptures say that everything written in the Bible is written for our learning so that we through them might learn not to do the things that they did that were wrong, to do the things that they did that were right. This is the reason these things are written here. This is, a, this is like an owner's manual from our Creator telling us how to live. And some people think about the life of Joseph. What does that have to do with me? I can guarantee you anything you're going through, there are lessons for you to learn from the life of Joseph and it's better to learn them at his expense than it is to learn it at your expense. You know, I didn't go through Bible school. I didn't have anybody who really mentored me. I had some people that mentored me from afar. I took their teachings and listened to them and things, but I didn't have a personal person to mentor me. And I went through a lot of things and I learned a lot of things by hard knocks. And I, I've got to admit that if you survive, it makes a great testimony. I've got some awesome testimonies. But I tell you what, there's a better way. And that's the reason we started Karis Bible College. That's the reason I'm on television trying to share these truths. And if you will receive it, I promise you this could just change your life. It could help you avoid all kinds of problems. And again, I say that there are people watching this program right now that you are in the midst of a mess and you're crying out and looking for help. That's probably why you've tuned in to a Christian station and watching a Christian program. And yet you don't realize that it was your choices that got you to this place. Now, I'm not saying you wanted the results that you've got, but nonetheless, God, if you would take His Word and read and study, you could learn how to avoid things. There are instructions in the Word, not for your hurt, but for your benefit. And Joseph, in my estimation, 
IS ONE OF THE GREATEST CHARACTERS IN THE BIBLE. YOU KNOW, THERE'S ONLY THREE PEOPLE THAT I CAN THINK OF IN THE BIBLE WHO DIDN'T HAVE SERIOUS FLAWS AND MAJOR MISTAKES, AND GOD DIDN'T REPROVE THEM. JOSEPH IS ONE OF THEM, SAMUEL IS ONE OF THEM, AND ALSO DANIEL. NOW, THERE MAY BE SOME OTHER, BUT AS FAR AS MAJOR CHARACTERS, the, JOSEPH IS ONE OF THE GREATEST EXAMPLES IN SCRIPTURE. MOSES, WHO WROTE FIVE BOOKS OF THE, new, of the OLD TESTAMENT, THE FIRST FIVE BOOKS, AND ALSO WROTE THE BOOK OF, uh, I MEAN, PSALMS CHAPTER 90. MOSES WAS A POWERFUL MAN OF GOD, BUT MOSES GOT OFF TRACK. HE KILLED A MAN THINKING THAT THAT WAS DOING GOD'S WILL, AND IT COST HIM 40 YEARS IN THE WILDERNESS, AND HE MADE SOME MAJOR MISTAKES, GOT MAD AND DISOBEYED GOD, AND IT COST HIM BEING ABLE TO GO INTO THE PROMISED LAND. YOU CAN TAKE DAVID, WHO MUCH OF THE OLD TESTAMENT IS WRITTEN ABOUT HIM, FIRST AND SECOND SAMUEL, FIRST KINGS, AND OF COURSE HE WROTE MANY OF THE PSALMS, AND DAVID WAS A MAN AFTER GOD'S OWN HEART AND DID SOME GREAT THINGS, AND YET HE TOOK HIS EYES OFF OF THE LORD. HE FELL INTO ADULTERY, MURDERED THE HUSBAND OF BATHSHEBA, TRYING TO COVER UP HIS ADULTERY. EVEN IN THE NEW TESTAMENT, DID YOU KNOW THAT SAUL, WHO BECAME PAUL, WROTE HALF OF THE BOOKS OF THE NEW TESTAMENT. HE PERSECUTED THE CHRISTIANS. HE uh, WAS IN AGREEMENT WITH THE STONING DEATH OF STEPHEN. HE WAS THERE, AND HE COMMITTED OTHER PEOPLE TO PRISON AND TESTIFIED AGAINST THEM EVEN TO THEIR DEATH. DID YOU KNOW THAT HALF OF THE... Uh, OF THE BIBLE WAS WRITTEN BY MURDERERS, PEOPLE WHO HAD MURDERED, AND PRAISE GOD FOR FORGIVENESS, AND GOD CHANGED THEM, AND BECAUSE OF THAT, MAN, IT WAS GOD SPEAKING THROUGH THEM. I'M NOT CRITICAL OF THEM, BUT I'M SAYING THAT REALLY THERE ARE VERY FEW CHARACTERS IN THE BIBLE WHO HAD THE CHARACTER THAT JOSEPH HAD. JOSEPH IS ONE OF THOSE THAT WAS NEVER REALLY REBUKED IN SCRIPTURE. NOW, THERE ARE SOME PEOPLE WHO TAKE THE STORY OF JOSEPH, AND THEY uh, SAY THAT HE STARTED OUT AS A SPOILED BRAT, AND IT WAS HIS OWN ARROGANCE AND STUFF THAT GOT HIM INTO TROUBLE. I'M GOING TO DISAGREE WITH THAT, AND I'M GOING TO SHOW YOU SCRIPTURES THAT I BELIEVE WILL GIVE YOU A DIFFERENT PERSPECTIVE ON THIS. BUT A SPOILED BRAT AND AN ARROGANT PERSON DOESN'T PROSPER THE WAY uh, THAT JOSEPH PROSPERED, AND THERE'S SCRIPTURES THAT BEAR THIS OUT. AND THEN SOME PEOPLE THINK THAT WHEN HIS BROTHERS CAME INTO EGYPT, THAT IT WAS HIS VENGEANCE. HE WAS GETTING EVEN WITH THEM AND REPAYING THEM BY BEING HARD ON THEM. I'M GOING TO SHOW YOU SCRIPTURES THAT WILL SPEAK DIFFERENTLY THAN THAT. AGAIN, I BELIEVE THAT IF YOU INTERPRET JOSEPH'S LIFE CORRECTLY, HE IS JUST A GREAT EXAMPLE. NOW, AGAIN, PRAISE GOD FOR THE PEOPLE WHO GOT OFF TRACK AND FOUND THE FORGIVENESS OF THE LORD, AND THEN GOD CHANGED THEM LIKE MOSES AND DAVID AND OTHERS, AND THOSE ARE GREAT EXAMPLES. BUT ALSO, uh, IT'S WONDERFUL TO HAVE AN EXAMPLE OF A PERSON WHO JUST REALLY STARTED SEEKING GOD FROM AN EARLY AGE AND STAYED WITH THE LORD AND DIDN'T HAVE ANY MAJOR, MAJOR FAILINGS IN HIS LIFE. AND I TELL YOU, JOSEPH INSPIRES ME. IT'S REALLY GOOD. SO ALL OF THAT'S INTRODUCTION JUST TO SAY THAT I KNOW SOME PEOPLE THINK, WHAT ARE YOU TALKING ABOUT SOMEBODY WHO LIVED 4,000 YEARS AGO? I NEED HELP TODAY WITH MY MARRIAGE, WITH MY FINANCES. I NEED HEALING. I NEED A... HOW IN THE WORLD are, IS THIS NATION EVER GOING TO TURN AROUND? AND YOU'RE FOCUSED ON THESE THINGS. IF YOU DON'T UNDERSTAND HISTORY, YOU'RE, de you're uh, DESTINED TO REPEAT IT. YOU CAN'T uh, REALLY UNDERSTAND WHAT IS HAPPENING RIGHT NOW UNLESS YOU HAVE SOME PERSPECTIVE OF HOW GOD HAS DEALT WITH PEOPLE, HOW GOD USED PEOPLE TO TURN SITUATIONS AROUND. AND I TELL YOU, JOSEPH IS A MAN WHO NOT ONLY AFFECTED HIMSELF AND HIS FAMILY, BUT HE LITERALLY CHANGED THE WORLD. GOD USED HIM IN A POWERFUL WAY AND GOD IS NO RESPECTER OF PERSONS. HE'LL DO THE SAME THING FOR YOU. SO LET'S START WITH THE LIFE OF JOSEPH. THIS IS IN GENESIS CHAPTER 37, AND IT SAYS IN VERSE 1, AND JACOB DWELT IN THE LAND WHEREIN HIS FATHER WAS A STRANGER IN THE LAND OF CANAAN. THESE ARE THE GENERATIONS OF JACOB. JOSEPH, BEING 17 YEARS OLD, WAS FEEDING THE FLOCK WITH HIS BRETHREN, AND THE LAD WAS WITH THE SONS OF BILHAH AND WITH THE SONS OF Zilphah, HIS FATHER'S WIVES, AND JOSEPH BROUGHT UNTO HIS FATHER THEIR EVIL REPORT. LET ME JUST SAY SOME THINGS TO PUT THIS INTO PERSPECTIVE. I KNOW THAT NOT EVERYBODY WHO WATCHES THIS PROGRAM IS A BIBLE SCHOLAR, HAS EVEN READ THE BIBLE, AND SO YOU NEED TO UNDERSTAND THAT THIS JACOB WAS HIS ORIGINAL NAME. THAT WAS THE GRANDSON OF ABRAHAM, THE ONE THAT GOD CHOSE AND STARTED THE JEWISH NATION THROUGH, AND JACOB, WAS HIS GRANDSON. HE HAD AN ENCOUNTER WITH THE LORD WHERE HE ACTUALLY WRESTLED WITH AN ANGEL, AND THIS ANGEL CHANGED HIS NAME TO ISRAEL. AND SO JACOB 
uh, was his original name. The Lord changed his name to Israel, and you'll hear these names used interchangeably and applied to the same person. So this is talking about Jacob or Israel, and he had a total of 12 sons. He first of all tried to marry Rachel, and he loved Rachel. She was a beautiful person, and on the wedding night, he went in, and it turned out that the father-in-law gave her not gave him not Rachel, but Leah, his older sister. In the morning, he recognized that you know there had been a switch of sisters, and he got furious and went to Laban, the father-in-law, and he says, "Well, in our country, there's a custom that you you have to marry off the oldest one first. And so anyway, he eventually gave him the second daughter, Rachel, the one he really wanted. So he had two wives there. Each one of them had maidens. And when they had trouble having children, each one of them gave their maidens to the, uh, Jacob or Israel. And so he wound up having a total of four wives, 12 sons. One of the daughters is mentioned, Diana. He probably had other daughters. But these 12 sons, this is what this is talking about. And Joseph was child number 11 out of 12. And Joseph was the first child that was born from Rachel, the one that Jacob really loved. And so Joseph was special to him. And Rachel, uh, she had Joseph as the 11th son of Israel or Jacob. And when she had the next son, which was Benjamin, that's the youngest son of uh, Jacob, uh, Rachel died in childbirth. And so uh, because of this, Jacob just really uh, doted on Joseph. That was his favorite son. And you can see that right here in these verses. In verse 3, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now this is an important piece of information right here. Because again, I said at the very start of this program, some people have thought that Joseph was arrogant in sharing his dreams and he was going around saying, I'm better than you. And so that Joseph is the one who caused his brothers to hate him and reject him. But before Jesus, I mean, excuse me, before Joseph had any of his dreams, before he began to tell his brothers these dreams, it says right here that it was his father who favored him, made him the coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that Jacob loved Joseph more than them, that's the reason that they hated him. This does not impute any sin, any transgression to Joseph. Now, uh, I think the worst thing that you could say about Joseph is that he was just a young kid. Uh, he might not have used as much wisdom as he could have, but the worst thing you could say about him was he was just young and unexperienced, and maybe he could have used more wisdom. But you can't impute unto him any maliciousness, any bragging, any arrogance, putting his brothers down. That's not what these scriptures say. This says it links their hatred for Joseph specifically to what uh, Jacob did. And there's a lesson to learn in this for parents, and that is that you can't prefer one child over another. You know, all of our children are different, and some of them have different talents. Some of them are smarter than others. Some of them are better looking than others. Some of them are more obedient, just have a tendency to obey, whereas the other ones may have a tendency to go the other direction. But parents have to love their children and not use this. This right here is an example that if you prefer a child and make it clear that you prefer one over the other, that causes the other one to have resentment and stuff. And so you shouldn't be doing that. In verse 5, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Now again, they hated him because of the dream that he had. But Joseph isn't the one who told this dream. I mean, brought this dream. He just told what had happened to him, but he didn't do anything to make this dream happen. He just shared what he had, and it just aggravated and amplified the hatred that they already had. And here's this dream in verse 6. He said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. You know, some people might think, what does that mean? Well, the next verse tells you it was clear that they understood 
the meaning of this. His brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And so the way that they took this, it was very clear that when Joseph's sheaf rose up above the others and then all of the other sheaves around about him bowed down to his sheaf, it was clear that this was talking about that Joseph was going to be exalted and his brothers would come and bow down to him. And they already hated him, and this just amplified their hatred. Again, Joseph, I don't believe, can be uh, attributed, any hatred or maliciousness could be attributed to him. At the, very le at the very most, it's just naiveness. He was just open and just sharing what God had done to him, what God had said. In verse 9, it says, He dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now, the first dream was about him being lifted up and others bowing down to him. Here, it says that he's lifted up so that the sun and the moon and the eleven stars. The eleven stars were talking about his brothers. His, the sun was talking about his father. The moon was talking about his mother. And... Um, here he is again. It's basically the same thing. It's the same point being communicated that he's going to be magnified and exalted and others are going to come bow down, bow down to him, even his 11 brothers and his father and his mother. And it says in verse 10, and he told it his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth. So here again is Jacob interpreting this dream. He knew very clearly that it talked about him, the sun, the moon, the mother, and the brothers coming and down, bowing down to him to the earth. And his brothers envied him, but his father observed the same. In other words, his father rebuked him, thinking this was arrogant on his part to be dreaming this. But again, Joseph didn't cause this. He didn't dream it up on his own. This is something that God gave him. And as we go through this story, you're going to find out that these dreams were given by God specifically to put a vision in the heart of Joseph and prepare him for 13 years of very negative things that were going to happen to him. And boy, there is a lesson here for each of us. I tell you, God has done this in my life. When I first got turned on to the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968, I didn't know details, but I just instantly knew that God had called me to share truths about Him, the things that He had shown me and the things He was doing in my life. He called me to share this with people all over the world. And I honestly believe that I was going to be ministering to people all over the world. Here I am now, 56 years later, and did you know that this program can be seen by 5.2 billion people per day? I didn't know the details. I didn't know how this was going to happen. But 56 years ago, God put that vision, that dream in my heart. And I can guarantee you, I went through a lot of hard years. I went through probably 32 years where there was nobody looking from the outside at me and my ministry thought we would ever reach more than just a few people. I pastored one church in Seagaville, Texas for two years and the largest crowd we ever had was 12. And that was a large crowd. Most of the time it was five. And then I went to Childress, Texas and the largest crowd we had was about 50 or 60. And then I went to Pritchett, Colorado, which we had about 100 people that came. And that was six years worth of pastoring with my largest crowd being 100. Now, that was 100 people in a town of 144 people, Pritchett, Colorado. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, I just, it seems like people were staying away from my meetings by the droves. And yet I had this knowledge, this vision, just like Joseph right here, had these dreams given to him that someday he would be exalted and his brothers and his father and mother would come and bow down to him. He had these dreams that he was going to succeed and not fail. And yet for 13 years, everything in Joseph's life went completely contrary to these dreams. And I'm going to be getting into more detail as we go through this. I won't be able to do all of this today. But there is a parallel here. 
that, you know, with us, God will give you a vision, a dream. It doesn't have to be a dream while you're asleep. Uh, it could be a dream while you're awake. It could just be God revealing and giving you a vision, a desire in your heart of, you know, a business that He's given you or some idea that He's given you that could make a difference or something that He wants you to do to write a book or to do something. Or you could be in ministry like I am and God could show you. And yet, I can guarantee you, when you first get that vision, you are going to have everything that the devil can throw at you trying to get you to move away from that vision. And the sad fact is we live in a fallen world and there are lots of people that are receptive to the devil and that will be his servants and that they will come across your path and they will do everything they can to stop your vision. This is, this is guaranteed in Scripture. It's certainly in the life of Joseph, and I can show you everybody. Moses went through this same thing. David went through this same thing. You can take anybody. There is not a single character in the Bible that God just touched them, and instantly they saw everything that God wanted in their life come to pass. They went through terrible things, and this is just not only typical of Bible characters. This is typical of you and me. The scripture says in Mark chapter 4 that once the seed is sown, then the fowls of the air come trying to steal it away. Then affliction and persecution comes. Then the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things will enter in. And all of those things, it's attributed to Satan, that Satan is the one that came to steal away the word that is in our heart. And I can guarantee you, once God reveals his will to you, Satan is going to throw everything he's got at you. He may take things that he's planned for 10 or 15 years in the future and throw them at you all at once because you'll be your weakest when you first have this revelation. There's a growth period. There's a maturity period that you have to go through before you can see God's will come to pass in your life. And Satan knows that if he lets you get rooted in the Word and if you put your roots down deep, that you'll be able to withstand a hurricane. So he'll come against you when you're young. It says over in Hebrews, it says, once you're enlightened, you endure a great fight of afflictions. This may be revelation to some of you today, but I'm telling you, just because God has a plan for your life doesn't mean that the devil just runs and hides. Instead, he's going to throw everything he's got at you. And Joseph is a great example of how he's... Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach a series through the life of Joseph. And uh, I just started this yesterday... And I have this book that is a 200-page book. This is a brand new book. I've had a book on this before, but this is a rewrite of it. So this is a new book, over 200 pages. We're asking for a gift of any amount uh, for this. And then we have this little brief summary that is a 50-page summarization of this. But I tell you, the life of Joseph is really detailed. You need to get the whole thing, but if you couldn't or wouldn't, you can get this free book as our gift to you. And then we also have CDs and DVDs that were taken from our television program, or you can get a USB right here that will have the audio and video on it. And um, I tell you, this is really going to be good. I gave an introduction yesterday about some of the background of Joseph. He was the 11th out of 12 sons that were born to Jacob, and he was the first son that was born to Jacob's favorite wife, and his wife died when she gave birth to the next son, the youngest son called Benjamin, and she died in childbirth. And because of this, uh, Joseph became J uh, Jacob's favorite son. He made him a coat of many colors, and he favored him over all of the other children. And because of this, the other brothers hated Joseph. Now, some people ascribe their hatred to Joseph and say it was because he was arrogant, he was brash, he was bragging about that he had these dreams that made him better. Uh, that's not what the Scripture says. Before Joseph ever had those dreams, it says that the brothers hated Joseph because of Jacob, the father, preferring him over all of the other children. So I don't believe that this was Joseph's fault. At the very worst, you might be able to say if he was more mature, maybe he could have mitigated some of their hatred and reaffirmed himself. But, but you can't blame a person for being young and just not knowing some things. Uh, Joseph, I believe, is a great character, and he had integrity, and I do not ascribe to him any arrogance on his part. 
I don't think that that's true. So we've already given the background on that. And then he had two dreams. And in these dreams, uh, he saw his sheaf. He, he and his brothers were binding sheaves of wheat in the field, and his sheaf stood up uh, upright, and all of the other sheaves fell down to it. He told his brothers that, and boy, they understood immediately this meant that someday they were going to come and bow down to him. No way. They hated him already because he was a favorite son, and they were not going to receive this. Then he had a second dream, and in this second dream, this time he was exalted, and the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars, talking about his 11 brothers, his father and mother would come and bow down to him. And boy, this just made it worse. And you know, over in Exodus chapter, or excuse me, it's Genesis chapter 41, when Joseph finally appears before Pharaoh and interprets his dreams, Pharaoh had two dreams. Now these weren't just two random or unconnected dreams, but the dreams basically were different, uh, you know, uh, symbolism being used, but it was making the exact same point. It was all about sevens. And uh, because of that, Joseph said that because the dream was doubled unto you, that means it's established. It can't be changed. And so that is a scriptural precedent right there that when you have the exact same point being made by multiple dreams, it's because it can't be changed. Now, that needs a little bit of interpretation. I'm not going to go into all of that. But nonetheless, the reason I bring that out is to say that Joseph had two dreams that were basically the same thing. Joseph is the one who said that because the dream was doubled, it's because it can't be changed. So I believe that these two dreams coming to Joseph were God reassuring him that he had a purpose for his life, that he was going to be exalted, and that his family, his brothers would come and bow down to him. And I believe that this was God giving him a vision of what his purpose for his life was. And yesterday, as we closed the program, I was just beginning to share about how important it is to have a vision. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but there are many, many, many people watching this program that you don't have a vision for your life. You've just never thought about it that way. It's like you just are doing whatever circumstances in life present you. And I, again, I'm not saying this in a critical way, but I'm trying to amplify how important it is for you to have a God-given purpose. Did you know if you don't have any certain destination in mind, if you're just going to go whichever way, well, then you can take any road and it'll get you there. But if you have a specific destination in mind, then that limits your choices. Matter of fact, there's a scripture in Proverbs chapter 29 that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But did you know some of the modern translations of that says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraints. What that means is that, see, if you don't have a vision, if you don't have a certain destination in mind, well, then you can take any road and it'll get you there. But if you have a certain destination, that limits your choices. It restrains you. You, you can't, like if you wanted to go west, well, then you can't take a road that's going to take you east. You've got, it limits your choices. And did you know that if you don't have a direction for your life, a God-given direction, then you are just going to go in any, any way and you just let circumstances, whatever presents itself. And I tell you, I can show you from the life of Joseph, I can show you from every single person's life in the Bible that the people that God used, the people that we look at and say, man, that was awesome what God in their, did in their life, they did not get there accidentally. They didn't get there sovereignly. They didn't get there, you know, just happenstance. They had to fight through opposition. They had to stand when it looked like it would have been easier to turn and go the other direction. And I can testify in my own life that God gave me a vision of what He wanted me to do in 1968. And I started moving in that direction, but it was at least 10 years before there was any verification that what I was doing was really going to be productive and that God was going to use me. Now, there were some things that happened, and from my standpoint, I, you know, God used them to confirm me. But I mean, if you were somebody from the outside looking in, uh, I, for six years, I pastored three churches, and the largest church I ever had was 100. People stayed away by the thousands. 
And uh, man, there was just so many, much opposition. And if I hadn't have known, if I hadn't have had a vision in me, and if I was just letting circumstances rule my life, I guarantee you, I would not be doing what I'm doing today. We would not be having the impact that we're having today. So I can say based on scriptures, I can say based on my own life that you need a purpose. And when you start in that direction, there is going to be opposition. If you never run into the devil, it's because you're both headed in the same direction. If you turn around and start swimming upstream, I guarantee you there's going to be resistance. An old dead fish can float downstream, but for you to go upstream, you got to have a purpose. There's got to be something that's motivating you. And there are people watching this program right now that you don't have a purpose. You may want to glorify God. You may want God to do good things in your life, but it's not going to happen accidentally. It's not going to happen by you just wanting it. You're going to have to open yourself up and let God put a vision, a dream in your heart. And this is exactly what happened with Joseph. God gave him these dreams when he was 17 years old. He was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. And in between that 17 and 30 years old, there was not a single positive thing that happened in Joseph's life. And I'm going to be expounding on that as we go through this. But it was these dreams, it was the vision that God put in his heart that kept him on track, that kept him from quitting and giving up. He had a word from God. And there's even a passage of scripture over in the book of Psalms that says, until the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord tried him. And what that's saying is until this word that God had given him of him being exalted and others bowing down to him, until that word came to pass, well, then the word that God had given him in these dreams, it tried him. It, it held him on track. And you've got to have a vision for your life. Where there is no vision, the people perish. They cast off restraint. They just go with the flow. They're like water and seek the lowest level, the path of least resistance. And sad to say, this is how most people are living their life. And I'm telling you, you will never find God's will, God's best, His highest plan for your life with that kind of an attitude. You got to have a point that you're aiming at. And man, that is important. You know, let me use this quote by T.E. Lawrence. He's uh, more commonly known by Lawrence of Arabia. He lived from 1888 until 1935. And here's what he said. He said, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. You know, that's not the way we talk today, but basically he's just saying that there's some people that dream at night and it's just a pizza dream. It didn't mean anything. It doesn't have any meaning to it. But he says the people who dream with their eyes open, in other words, they're seeing with their heart. They aren't letting what they see and experience with their physical eyes dominate and control them, but they have a vision from God of accomplishing something and they are going by vision they're going by a revelation that God has given them. Those are dangerous men. Those are the ones who change the world. And this works not only for good, it works for evil. You can look at Hitler. You can look at, I don't know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Genghis Khan. You can go throughout history and people had this dream to be the most powerful man, to expand their kingdom. And in the process, killed millions of people and did terrible things. So it'll work for good or for bad. But the people who really... Who, who really change the world, who make a difference, are people that have a vision, a purpose to their life. The people that are just going through life and they don't have any purpose, they're just living and they live from day to day and they just get up and go to work, come home, watch television, go to bed and then repeat. Those aren't the people that are changing the world. It's people that have a vision on the inside. I tell you, this is so important. And I know that there's people watching this right now that you think, but I don't have a vision and I'm not a minister or I'm not a politician. I'm not going to be a president. I'm not going to be one of these movers and shakers. Did you know if you study Psalms chapter 139, I've got other materials that goes into more detail. I'm not going to 
spend a lot of time on this, but Psalms 139, if you look in the NIV, I believe it's verse 16, it even talks about that while you were still in your mother's womb, God had written in a book what all of your days should be. Every single day, God had a plan for every single person's life. And this isn't limited to ministers. This isn't limited to just a few people who become the leaders. This is for every single person. It says in Jeremiah chapter 1, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah and He says, Before you came forth out of your mother's womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. That was before He had done anything. While He was still in His mother's womb, God had a purpose for him. Uh, Paul said the same thing over in Galatians chapter 1, I believe it's verse 15, when he says, When it pleased God, I was separated unto the gospel from my mother's womb. So there's at least three examples right there that every single one of us, God has a purpose for your life. It's not up to you to do whatever, you know, just comes to you and trust that fate is going to make things work. Again, my personal testimony, I would not be where I am today. You would not be watching me on television if I just went by natural things. Man, I have had to persevere and fight past things. I was an introvert, couldn't look at a person in the face. If I would have just gone with my natural tendencies, you'd have never seen me on television. And then I've had financial problems. I was so poor, I couldn't pay attention. I had to fight through those things and I've just had to do many, many things. Anybody who is going to succeed and see God use them and stuff, it doesn't happen just naturally. It's, it's easier to go with the flow than it is to turn around and do what God called you to do. And I just really feel in my heart that God is speaking to some people who think that, well, you, you don't have a God-given purpose. You're just here and it's up to you to do whatever you want to do. And if you're a believer, you may pray and say, God, bless what I'm doing. Well, it's not good enough for you to do your own thing and ask God to bless it. You need to find out what God called you to do. God has a purpose. Now, He doesn't force His purpose on you. You have total freedom of choice. The Scripture says clearly in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, it says, Behold, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. He told you, you've got life and death. You've got a choice. God does not force you to do His will. He'll tell you which is the right choice. He says, choose life, but He doesn't force you to do it. God had written in His book what every single day of your life should be like, but He doesn't force that on you. It doesn't come to pass sovereignly. And there's a lot of Christian people that have taken the sovereignty of God to an extreme to where every single thing that happens is God. And there are people that will even say that if they're out committing adultery, if they're lying, if they're stealing, well, it must be God's will because God is sovereign. That is just wrong. God has a plan for you that is completely independent of what you deserve. It's completely independent of your performance. It was written in a book before you were ever born, but you have total freedom whether you're going to obey God or not. So I say all of these things to say that just like Joseph, God gave him these two dreams and doubled it to give him an assurance that this is going to happen. And that kept him on course when for 13 years, not a single thing looked like it was working in his favor. And I tell you, if he hadn't had this word from God, if he hadn't have known for certain that God had spoken to him and said, on the other side of all of these difficulties is going to be something that's worth it and that you've got to stay on track. If he hadn't have had that, I don't believe he would have lasted. I can say in my own life, if God hadn't have given me a vision and impressed things on me back in 1968, I would have never been able to survive the things I went through in Vietnam and then trying to get started in ministry and opposition and things coming against me. And in my own life, in the life of Joseph, in the life of all of the characters that I see in the Bible, God gave them a glimpse of what was ahead to prepare them and to keep them motivated. Now, the Lord doesn't show us the full thing. And there's some people that will sit there and not move in any direction because they want to have the whole thing explained to them. And that's not how it works either. 
GOD WON'T SHOW YOU STEP ONE THROUGH TEN OF WHAT YOUR LIFE IS SUPPOSED TO BE LIKE BECAUSE WHAT THAT WOULD DO IS JUST MAKE YOU MORE ACCOUNTABLE. IF FOR SOME REASON YOU DON'T ACCOMPLISH ALL TEN OF THOSE THINGS HE'S CALLING YOU TO DO, THEN IT'D JUST MAKE YOU MORE ACCOUNTABLE AND IT WOULD JUST BRING MORE CONDEMNATION TO YOU. GOD WILL SHOW YOU THINGS STEP BY STEP AND HE, he DOESN'T GIVE YOU THE FULL THING. In 1968, the Lord showed me I was going to be reaching people all over the world, but I didn't have a clue how it was going to come to pass. And at that time, I didn't even know that I'd be ministering the Word. I didn't know that I was going to uh, be a teacher. I didn't ever see myself on television at that time. But I did know that somehow God was going to help me to take the things He was showing me and doing in my life and share it with people all over the world. So I started moving in that direction. AND THEN IT BEGAN TO START BECOMING CLEARER. GOD REVEALED TO ME THAT HE HAD CALLED ME AND ANOINTED ME TO BE A TEACHER. AND SO I STARTED TEACHING IN, in CHURCH, IN SUNDAY SCHOOL, AND IN BIBLE STUDIES. AND THEN THAT PROGRESSED INTO ME PASTORING THREE LITTLE CHURCHES AND THEN STARTING TO TRAVEL. AND THEN I STARTED ON RADIO. AND THEN I STARTED ON TELEVISION. THEN WE STARTED A BIBLE SCHOOL. THERE HAVE BEEN STEPS ALONG THE WAY. BUT SEE, I HAD TO START AND JUST START MOVING WITH THE REVELATION THAT I HAD. AND I DO MEET PEOPLE THAT THEY'RE JUST WAITING AND THEY KNOW THAT GOD WANTS THEM TO DO SOMETHING, BUT THEY'RE WANTING TO KNOW THE END RESULT. THEY WANT TO KNOW EVERYTHING AND THEY AREN'T GOING TO MOVE UNTIL THERE'S NO FAITH INVOLVED. THEY WANT GOD TO SOLVE ALL THEIR PROBLEMS. LET ME JUST USE AN EXAMPLE HERE THAT, YOU KNOW, I'VE TALKED TO PEOPLE WHO WANT TO COME TO BIBLE COLLEGE AND THEY KNOW, THEY TOLD ME THAT GOD TOLD THEM TO COME TO BIBLE COLLEGE, BUT THEY'RE GOING TO WAIT UNTIL THEY HAVE EVERYTHING WORKED OUT. THEY'RE WAITING ON THEIR RETIREMENT TO KICK IN. THEY'RE WAITING ON THEIR STOCKS TO INCREASE. THEY'RE WAITING ON uh, THEIR HOUSE TO SELL. THEY'RE WAITING ON GETTING A JOB OUT HERE. THEY WANT TO MAKE SURE THAT THEY'VE GOT... AND THEY'RE WAITING UNTIL THERE IS JUST... EVERYTHING IS TAKEN CARE OF AND THERE'S NO FAITH INVOLVED. IT DOESN'T USUALLY WORK THAT WAY. GOD WILL REVEAL SOMETHING TO YOU. IF HE TELLS YOU TO DO SOMETHING LIKE GO TO BIBLE COLLEGE OR IF HE TELLS YOU TO START A BUSINESS OR IF HE TELLS YOU TO DO WHATEVER IT IS, YOU AREN'T GOING TO JUMP FROM WHERE YOU ARE INTO THE FULFILLMENT OF THAT IMMEDIATELY. YOU JUST HAVE TO START IN THAT DIRECTION. ONE OF THE THINGS WE OFTEN TELL PEOPLE WHO ARE SAYING THAT, YOU KNOW, GOD TOLD THEM TO COME TO BIBLE COLLEGE AND THEY DON'T KNOW HOW IT'S GOING TO WORK AND STUFF, I SAY, WELL, PUT DOWN A REGISTRATION. AND IF YOU JUST TAKE A STEP IN THAT DIRECTION, SEE, THAT'S MOVING IN THAT DIRECTION, AND YOU TAKE THAT STEP, THEN GOD WILL SHOW YOU THE NEXT STEP AND THE NEXT STEP. THERE'S ALWAYS STEPS TOWARDS WHAT GOD IS CALLING YOU TO DO. AND YOU CAN CERTAINLY SEE THAT IN JOSEPH'S LIFE. HE GOT THESE DREAMS WHEN HE WAS 17 YEARS OLD, BUT HE WAS 30 YEARS OLD WHEN HE FINALLY STOOD BEFORE PHARAOH AND HE BEGAN TO SEE THESE DREAMS START COMING TO PASS. AND IN BETWEEN THAT 17-YEAR-OLD AND 30-YEAR-OLD WAS NOTHING BUT HARDSHIP. HIS BROTHERS HATED HIM, SOLD HIM INTO SLAVERY, AND THEN IN SLAVERY, THE MASTER'S WIFE LIED ABOUT HIM AND ACCUSED HIM OF TRYING TO RAPE HER, AND THEN HE WENT FROM SLAVERY INTO BEING IN PRISON, AND IN PRISON HE, he MINISTERED TO PEOPLE AND THEY DID NOT RESPOND WELL TO HIM. HE SAID, REMEMBER ME WHEN YOU COME BACK BEFORE PHARAOH, AND THEY FORGOT HIM FOR TWO YEARS. HE SPENT 13 YEARS, AND IT SEEMED LIKE EVERY STEP HE TOOK WAS DOWN, NOT UP. BUT DID YOU KNOW WHAT? IT SAYS IN PSALMS THAT UNTIL THE WORD OF THE LORD CAME, THE WORD OF THE LORD TRIED HIM. THIS WORD, THIS VISION THAT HE HAD FROM GOD IS WHAT HELD HIM. YOU COULD TURN OVER TO HEBREWS CHAPTER 6, AND IT TALKS ABOUT THAT GOD SWORE TO ABRAHAM SO THAT HE COULD GIVE HIM STRONG CONSOLATION. IT'S THE EXACT SAME PRINCIPLE. HE GAVE ABRAHAM A VISION OF COUNT THE STARS IN THE SKY, SO SHALL YOUR SEED BE. HE GAVE HIM A VISION, A DREAM ABOUT WHERE HE WAS GOING. AND IN ABRAHAM'S LIFETIME, HE DIDN'T SEE THOSE THINGS COME TO PASS. BUT THAT VISION HELD HIM. AND IT SAYS THAT GOD USED THAT AND KEPT HIM ON TRACK. AND IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 6, IT SAYS WE HAVE THESE PROMISES THAT GIVE US A STRONG HOPE. HOPE IS A uh, CONFIDENT EXPECTATION ABOUT THE FUTURE BASED ON THE REVELATIONS THAT GOD HAS GIVEN YOU. AND IT SAYS IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 6 THAT THAT HOPE IS AN ANCHOR THAT ENTERS INTO THAT WITHIN THE VEIL, TALKING ABOUT INTO THE HOLY PLACE, AND IT KEEPS US ANCHORED. IF YOU DON'T HAVE A HOPE, IF YOU DON'T HAVE A CONFIDENT EXPECTATION ABOUT THE FUTURE BASED ON A REVELATION THAT GOD HAS GIVEN YOU, 
then you'll be blown about with all of the storms and the winds and the waves. You won't stay on course. You need... Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm teaching through a series I've entitled Lessons from Joseph. And I have a book on this that is brand new. First time we've released this book. And uh, this is a 200 plus page book. We are asking for a donation of any amount. We want you to have this, but we do need you to give something towards that. If people, if, you know, if nobody gave, we couldn't do this. We'll have, I don't know, 60 or 70,000 of these books that we'll give out. And I've also given a brief introduction to it. If for some reason you couldn't give anything, we have this as an absolute free gift to you. It's introduction to lessons from Joseph. And so we've got those two things. And then we've got CDs and DVDs that are taken from a television program. And I've got a USB that will have the audio and video on the USB. And we'll be giving out that information at the end of the program. I've already spent two days introducing this out of the 37th chapter of the book of Genesis. And this is where the story of Joseph starts. And he was the favorite son of his father. His father made him a coat of many colors. Because his father favored Joseph over all of the other brothers, the other 11 brothers hated him and persecuted him. And then he had two dreams from God that he was going to be exalted and others would come and bow down to him. And man, that just aggravated the situation. And so his brothers hated him because of that. And I spent all of yesterday just talking about how important it is to have God give you a vision of where your life is going and what He wants to do in you and through you. And I spent all yesterday doing that. I'm not going to go back through all of that, but that is so important. And most people just do not have a clear vision of what God created them for. You know, I minister all around the world and I've taught on these things many, many times. And I will give an invitation uh, to people. And these are people that come to a meeting. It's not just a Sunday service. They're nod to God crowd. But these are people that come midweek. These are the fanatics or it was either somebody that was drugged there by a fanatic. And these are people that are relatively on fire for God compared to just the average person that claims to be a Christian. And yet I'll give an invitation after I've taught on these things and say, if you don't know for sure that what you're doing is what God created you for, if you're just letting circumstances drive your life and you're doing whatever it takes just to survive and get along, well then stand up and let me pray for you that God will give you revelation. And I usually have at least 70 to 80 percent of the congregation stand up and say that they don't know for sure what God has called them to do. And I tell you, you aren't going to get there accidentally. You aren't going to get there sovereignly. God doesn't just manipulate your life. You have to have a purpose, a direction for your life. And that's what God did with Joseph. He burned these dreams into his heart that someday he was going to be in a position where people would come bow down to him. And because of that, that's what preserved him and kept him going all of those years. Man, that is powerful. So the story goes on that after all of these things had happened, after he had these dreams, uh, his, uh, actually this was just 10 of his 11 brothers because Benjamin was very young and he was still at home. But 10 of his brothers were out feeding the flocks and uh, they, they were away from home. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, uh, gave him some food and things like this and sent him to go find his brothers and give them these things and find out how they were doing. Apparently they were gone weeks or maybe months at a time, probably, uh, you know, following the grasslands and things like this for a season. So they could have been gone months at a time. And so Joseph was sent by his father to go uh, bring these things to his brothers. And his brothers, when they saw him afar off, this is in Genesis chapter 3, 37 verse 18 it says and when they saw him afar off even before he came near unto them they conspired against him to slay him and they said one to another behold this dreamer cometh and uh, 
You know, they already hated him before his dreams, but when his dreams came about, he was going to be exalted and they would bow down to him. They hated him more. They resented this and they were never going to, on their own free will, bow down to Joseph. And so they said, this dreamer cometh. And they said, come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And so here he is going, doing what his father told him to do, being obedient, and yet his brothers conspired to kill him. You know, this is something that a lot of people miss in this story. But again, you need to know some of the background. Reuben was the firstborn son of Jacob, and yet Reuben committed incest with another one of Jacob's wives. He went in and defiled her, and because of this, Jacob cursed him. And this was an evil man. He committed incest with the stepmother. And then Simeon and Levi were number two and number three born sons. Simeon and Levi went into a city, and there was a prince, the son of the king of this city, and he had had sexual relationships with Diana, which was their sister. That was a daughter of Jacob. And because of this, they lied to the man, and they went in and killed every man in that city. We don't know the number, but it was hundreds of people that they went and killed them all, and then they took all of the women and the children and the animals as, uh, you know, spoil from the city. And because of this, Jacob said, man, you've put me in a place that everybody's going to come kill me, and yet the fear of the Lord fell on them, and God protected them. But these are the oldest three sons of uh, Jacob, a man who committed incest with one of his stepmothers. The other two sons killed hundreds of people, took all of the women and children captive. And then the fourth son of Jacob was named Judah. And Judah is a man who in the 38th chapter of the book of Genesis, he committed incest with his daughter-in-law. His son had died and he actually had sexual relationships with his daughter-in-law, and she had twins out of that. And so these are the first four sons. They were evil people. They were mean people. And you can see that right here because when they saw him coming out of jealousy, they were going to kill uh, Jake, uh, Joseph. So these were evil people. And sometimes people don't understand this. And later on in the story, when they come before Joseph and he's in Egypt, this is the reason that he was so hard on them. It wasn't vengeance. It wasn't getting even with them for the way that they had treated him. It was him, it was Joseph being inspired by God to bring these guys to the end of themselves. And later when we get over there, I'll bring this out uh, even more clearly. But Joseph specifically said that he was doing these things so that they could humble themselves. And finally they came to a place, we're guilty and they humbled themselves, and they were willing to literally put their life on the line to save the life of uh, Benjamin. And so there's a, you need to understand these things to get the full impact. But here is Joseph going down to his brothers. They plan on killing him, and in verse 21 it says, Reuben, this is the oldest son, the one that committed incest with the stepmother, says, when he heard it, he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. You know, let me just say some things here, and I'm not going to be able to go into great detail on this, but some people just that believe that God is sovereign and stuff, they believe that God ordained that the brothers hated uh, Joseph. I do not believe that. God is not the one that causes us to hate people. They believe that God is the one who orchestrated Joseph being sold into slavery and that God will put terrible things on you and lead you through these things to break you and to humble you, etc. I do believe that God is the one who inspired these brothers to sell Joseph into slavery, but it wasn't because that was God's perfect will. It was because they were trying to kill him. And he even put into the heart of Reuben, this man who committed incest with his mother and, uh, you know, stepmother, he put it into his heart to save uh, Joseph's life. If God hadn't have intervened, he, uh, these brothers would have killed him. God doesn't just flow external and intervene in the affairs of man. He always has to flow through somebody. So in this case, he raised up Reuben, and Reuben tried to save 
the life of Joseph and, and said that instead of killing him, let's just put him in this pit and we'll let him die of natural causes. But that way we won't be responsible for his death. And Reuben planned on coming back later and saving him and delivering him back to his father. So God used a person to stop these brothers from doing what they wanted to do. And then while Reuben was off, probably tendering, tending the flocks and stuff, the other brothers saw some Midianites coming down on their way to Egypt. And they said, hey, we, instead of just letting him die in this pit, we could sell him to these Midianites and these Ishmaelites and we can make some money off of him. You know, the scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now again, God didn't make them want to take their brother and sell them. That wasn't God's perfect will, but it was better than them killing him. And I believe that the Lord took their love of money, this greed, and used it to save Joseph from these brothers. So some people think that this was God's perfect plan all along. I'm not sure it was a perfect plan. I, it was probably plan B or plan C, depending upon what the brothers were doing, but it turned out to be to Joseph's advantage because it kept the brothers from killing him. Now, these are important things. And you know, I, I do believe this, that as much as we depend upon a GPS thing and you know, you're taking directions from your GPS device, and if you make a wrong turn, that thing just recalculates and it can get you back on target. It doesn't matter how far off target you are. You, he can get you back on target. This doesn't mean that this was the perfect way that God had of getting Joseph into this position. And yet when there were wrong turns made and the brothers were trying to kill him, he was able to use whatever they did and work it together for good. This is what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is saying. It didn't say that everything that happens comes from God, but it does say that whatever happens, if you are interceding, and letting the Holy Spirit intercede with you. And if you love God and if you're called according to His purpose, God will make whatever the devil throws at you come together for good. And so here's another lesson, see, that we can learn from Joseph, that this wasn't God's perfect plan, but God intervened through people and kept Joseph from being killed. And so these brothers took him, put him in the pit, wound up selling him to the Ishmaelites, and then they took his coat of many colors that Jacob had given him as a sign of him being the favorite son, and they killed one of the animals and put the animal blood upon Joseph's coat. And then they went back to their father, and uh, it says here in verse 31, it says, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of goats and dipped the coat in the blood, and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. And of course, it was, this was a unique coat. It was obvious that this was Joseph's coat. And in verse 33, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Boy, here's another lesson that you can learn from this thing. And uh, it goes on to say that uh, Jacob, he began to mourn and his children tried to comfort him and he refused to be comforted. He says, I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. And we know that it was 22 years before uh, Jacob found out that Joseph was still alive and was in Egypt and was now the ruler over all of Egypt. So for 22 years, Jacob grieved over a situation that was not accurate. And he looked at things like a coat with blood on it and just jumped to the conclusion that some evil beast had killed him. He didn't know what had really happened. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, so much of our grief, so much of our stuff is because we aren't looking at things properly because we don't see things. I've actually talked, there's a woman that we have a video about. We produced a little testimony. It was just a two minute interview that we did with her but she had a little girl that died and she was grieving even to the point of committing suicide. She wanted to be with her daughter so much and she heard my teaching about how to deal with grief and she realized that instead of looking at it as like this girl was just totally gone, she realized that her daughter was with the Lord and that she would meet her someday and she began to start thanking God for the time that she had with her. She thanked the Lord that this 
girl was now with the Lord. And I tell you, this lady has been totally set free and you see her today and she's rejoicing and going on with her life. There's a lot of people that don't look at things properly. I remember when my brother, uh, his wife died in a car wreck and they had been married for like, I don't know, 30 or something years, had two children and they were super close. She had some uh, physical things, arthritis and stuff. And my brother uh, really took care of her and they were super close and she died in this car wreck. And when she did, uh, my brother went in a tailspin. And of course I went to the funeral and I called him and I would talk to him and uh, he was just struggling. And then I don't remember what period of time, it was just a few months later, I called him and all of a sudden he was just back to himself. It was like he was just over it. And I was shocked. And I said, what happened? And he said, he of course was praying about all this and the Lord just spoke to him and he says, you're either gonna have to dig a hole next to your wife and crawl in and die with her or you need to get on with your life and you need to trust me. And so he just, he just threw that care over on the Lord, got over it and I forget the exact amount of time, but in a year or two after that, he met another lady and they've now been married for 20 years or something like that. And it's just amazing. God has blessed him and they have a great relationship. But I'm saying there's, there's a lot of people that just make this same decision that Jacob did. And let me just continue to read. It says in verse 34 that Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and moored for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And so he just refused to be comforted. There are some people watching this program that you refuse to be comforted. And I'm not saying you haven't had tragedy. I'm not saying bad things haven't happened. But I am saying that Jesus bore our sorrows and carried our grief out of Isaiah chapter 53. And you are bearing something that you don't have to bear. You can cast your care over on the Lord. And Joseph was still alive. Jacob was mourning over something that hadn't happened. Now, there, it was terrible that his brothers had sold him into slavery, but it wasn't as bad as him being torn in pieces by some beast. He was mourning over something that he shouldn't have been mourning over. And there are people watching this program that you are mourning over something that I'm not saying it's not terrible, but you, you shouldn't go down to the grave mourning. You shouldn't refuse to be comforted because Jesus said that he bore your sorrows and carried your grief. Second Corinthians chapter one says that he comforts us in all of our tribulation that we may know how to comfort others that are also in a similar situation. There is supernatural comfort from God. And regardless of what's happened to you today, regardless of what's just broken your heart, the scripture said Jesus, his very first message in the synagogue in Nazareth, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. There is an anointing on Jesus to heal your broken heart. And I believe that God is speaking to people right now, reaching out to people that you've just refused to be comforted. And you know what? You need to put this behind you. Again, I'm not saying that it's not tragic. I'm not saying that there isn't a place for you, uh, you know, for a brief period of time dealing with things, but to just refuse to be comforted and live the rest of your life like this, this is not what God's intended. And there is an anointing upon Jesus. There's an anointing on this program right now. God is speaking to people. And if you'll receive it, your grief can be broken today. You just need to call out to God and you need to let him come in and, and bear your sorrows and carry your griefs as Jesus has already done. And you need to cast this grief over on the Lord. J Jacob suffered for 22 years in a way that he didn't have to suffer. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to spend the rest of your life this way. And this is one of the great things that you can learn through this story of Joseph. And so Joseph was sold into slavery and the story uh, continues in chapter 39. Chapter 38 is just a brief interlude and it goes to talking about Judah. He was the fourth born son of Jacob and Judah 
had uh, three sons, and the first one was so evil that it says that God killed him. And he was married, and so according to the custom of that day, the brother had to go in and raise up seed to the deceased brother. And so the first child that was born of that union was not counted as his son. It was counted as the son of the brother who had died. And he didn't want to do that, and so he refused to do it, and God killed the second son. And because of that, uh, the youngest son, his name was Selah, and he was uh, too young to give in marriage, and so he promised the widow of these first two boys that when the youngest son got old enough, he would give him to that woman so that uh, he could raise up seed to the two previous brothers, and yet he didn't do it. I suspect that Judah probably didn't want him being slain because of some iniquity. And so anyway, the son was now old enough that he could have married this woman, and, he, and uh, Judah wouldn't give uh, the son to the woman. And so the woman dressed up as a prostitute and enticed Judah, and he went in and had sexual relationships with her, with, uh, with the girl. And anyway, when the uh, girl went back home, it was told... Judah, that she was pregnant and she was a widow. She was waiting on this youngest son. And Judah got so mad that he brought her in front of him and reamed her out and said that he was going to burn her for her sin. And then she produced the ring and the staff that was Judah's that he had given in pledge to this woman when he thought she was just a prostitute. He didn't realize it was his own daughter-in-law. And she said, this is the man's uh, staff and ring that got me pregnant. And, and Judah realized that she was more righteous than him, and so he repented. And anyway, she had two children, had twins out of this. That's what's recorded in this 38th chapter, kind of an interlude in the story of Joseph. But this, this makes the point that Judah and Simeon and Levi and Reuben were evil, evil men. And a lot of what happened with Joseph wasn't only to save the Egyptians. It wasn't only to save uh, Jacob and his household. But God used Joseph to bring these evil men to the end of themselves, to where they actually were willing to lay down their life. And they were willing to go into slavery and become slaves if, uh, you know, the master of Egypt would just release Benjamin and let him go back. And they were doing this for their father because he was an old man, and they said it would kill him if Benjamin was kept. And so these guys were actually brought to the end of themselves, to a place to where they repented, and that's what God used Joseph to do. So this is a powerful story. I want to thank Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This week I've started a teaching that I've entitled Lessons from Joseph, and I'm just taking the life of Joseph and going through what God did with him and making applications to us. And uh, we've already covered some really, really important things. I've got this little booklet that is just a brief summary of this larger teaching. This is a brand new book, first time we've released this, and it's Lessons from Joseph. It's 200 plus pages. We're asking for a donation of any amount for this. There is a suggested donation for those of you that wonder what we would like to get for it. And so we have a suggested donation, but then we'll give this to you as a free gift. And then we have CDs and DVDs that were taken from our television program and a USB that will have the audio and video on it. And we'll give out that information again at the end of the program. So we started in Genesis chapter 37 about how Joseph was given these two dreams from God that he would be exalted and people would come and bow down to him and God gave these to him to protect him and to keep him in hope, even though there was going to be a lot of negative things happen to him. I do not believe God is the source of these negative things. It does say that God sold him into slavery. Jo Joseph said that himself, that God sent me ahead to preserve life, but it was because of the alternatives. What was the alternatives? The brothers were going to try and kill him. And they threw him into a pit and eventually sold him to these people, and Joseph became a slave. But that wasn't because that God wanted him to be a slave. It was because he got him away from his brothers. His brothers were going to kill him. 
AND HIS FATHER, JACOB, THOUGHT HE HAD BEEN KILLED BY SOME ANIMAL BECAUSE THEY TOOK HIS COAT OF MANY COLORS, WHICH WAS VERY UNIQUE TO JOSEPH, PUT ANIMAL'S BLOOD ON IT, AND JACOB JUST ASSUMED THAT HE HAD BEEN KILLED BY ANIMALS. AND SO FOR 22 YEARS, HE GRIEVED OVER A SITUATION THAT WASN'T EVEN ACCURATE. IT WASN'T EVEN TRUE WHAT HE WAS GRIEVING OVER. SO THE STORY CONTINUES WHEN JOSEPH GETS DOWN INTO EGYPT, AND IN GENESIS CHAPTER 39, VERSE 1, IT SAYS, AND JOSEPH WAS BROUGHT DOWN TO EGYPT, AND POTIPHAR, AN OFFICER OF PHARAOH, CAPTAIN OF THE GUARD, AN EGYPTIAN, BOUGHT HIM OF THE HANDS OF THE ISHMAELITES, WHICH HAD BROUGHT HIM DOWN THITHER. AND LOOK AT THIS. THIS IS ONE OF MY FAVORITE SCRIPTURES. IN GENESIS CHAPTER 39, VERSE 2, IT SAYS, AND THE LORD WAS WITH JOSEPH, AND HE WAS A PROSPEROUS MAN, AND HE WAS IN THE HOUSE OF HIS MASTER, THE EGYPTIAN. THAT IS JUST AMAZING RIGHT THERE. MOST PEOPLE WOULD NOT HAVE HAD THIS uh, TAKE ON THE SITUATION. JOSEPH HAD BEEN THE FAVORITE SON OF A VERY WEALTHY MAN, JACOB. HE HAD THIS COAT OF MANY COLORS. HE LIVED IN LUXURY. HE WAS PAMPERED BY HIS FATHER. BUT BECAUSE HIS BROTHERS TRIED TO KILL HIM AND EVENTUALLY SOLD HIM INTO SLAVERY, HERE JOSEPH WAS STANDING ON AN AUCTION BLOCK BEING SOLD INTO SLAVERY. AND DID YOU KNOW THAT THE WAY THEY SOLD A SLAVE WAS THEY STRIPPED YOU NAKED. AND HE HAD HIS CLOTHES, HIS WHATEVER CLOTHES WERE LEFT BECAUSE HIS COAT OF MANY COLORS HAD BEEN TAKEN FROM HIM. SO WHATEVER CLOTHES HE HAD, THEY WERE JUST IN A PILE BESIDE HIM. SO HERE JOSEPH IS STANDING THERE TOTALLY NAKED SO THAT THE BUYERS COULD SEE WHAT THEY WERE BUYING. AND GOD SAYS, JOSEPH WAS A PROSPEROUS MAN. I CAN IMAGINE POTIPHAR STANDING THERE IN ALL OF HIS ROBES, AND HE PROBABLY HAD JEWELS AND GOLD AND RINGS AND ALL KINDS OF THINGS, AND HE LOOKED LIKE A PROSPEROUS MAN. MOST PEOPLE WOULD THINK POTIPHAR WAS PROSPEROUS. HERE'S JOSEPH BEING sold, SOLD, STRIPPED NAKED AS A SLAVE, AND HE WOULDN'T BE CONSIDERED A PROSPEROUS MAN. BUT WHEN GOD WROTE ABOUT IT, GOD SAYS JOSEPH WAS A PROSPEROUS MAN, NOT POTIPHAR. BOY, THIS IS POWERFUL. DID YOU KNOW GOD SEES THINGS? DIFFERENTLY THAN WE SEE THINGS. AND THIS IS ONE OF THE BIG PROBLEMS. HOW CAN TWO WALK TOGETHER EXCEPT THEY BE AGREED IS WHAT THE SCRIPTURE SAYS. AND THE FACT IS MOST OF US ARE SO CARNAL. WE JUST LOOK AT THINGS IN THE NATURAL. WE LOOK AT OUR SITUATION AND WE DON'T PROPERLY EVALUATE THINGS. BUT I TELL YOU, YOU'VE GOT TO GET TO WHERE YOU SEE THINGS THE WAY THAT GOD SEES THINGS. AND THAT'S THE REASON THAT HE GAVE US THIS WORD. THIS IS THE REASON HE GAVE US STORIES LIKE THIS ABOUT JOSEPH is to show us that it doesn't matter how people see you. It doesn't matter what your circumstances look like. What does God say about you? You know, I can remember back when Jamie and I were going through our poverty days, and this was totally my fault. God's not the one who put me in this poverty. Now, God used it, and I learned a lot of things, and today I am still thankful. You know, last week I had to go do some shopping for Jamie AT THE GROCERY STORE. I DON'T HARDLY EVER DO THAT, BUT SHE WANTED SOMETHING AND I WENT TO GET IT. AND uh, I, AS I WAS BUYING THESE FEW LITTLE ITEMS THAT I HAD, I REMEMBER BEING IN GROCERY STORES WHEN JAMIE AND I COULDN'T BUY HARDLY ANYTHING. WE WERE STARVING AND WE WOULD GO LOOK AT ALL OF THIS FOOD AND WE COULDN'T GET ANY OF IT. AND I REMEMBER JUST LAST WEEK, I MEAN 50-SOMETHING YEARS LATER, HERE I AM AND I'M STILL THANKFUL AND I REMEMBER WALKING THROUGH THAT GROCERY STORE AND JUST THANKING THE LORD. THANK YOU, FATHER, THAT WE HAVE THE MONEY THAT WE CAN BUY WHATEVER IT IS THAT WE NEED. SO GOD USED IT. I'M NOT SAYING THAT, uh, YOU KNOW, IT WASN'T SOMETHING THAT THE LORD USED IN MY LIFE, BUT IT WASN'T GOD'S WILL THAT I WENT THROUGH THAT POVERTY. THAT WAS MY OWN STUPIDITY. I WAS TOLD BY SOMEONE THAT IF YOU WERE CALLED TO MINISTER, THAT YOU WOULD BE SINNING AGAINST GOD TO GO GET A JOB because you were called to the ministry and you should get your money from the ministry. And so because of that wrong thinking, I refused to work for about the first five years of our marriage. And boy, Jamie and I went through poverty and through a lot of things, and it was my own fault. Now, God used it, and I'm thankful that I learned some lessons through it, but that wasn't God's will. AND DID YOU KNOW IT WASN'T GOD? THIS WASN'T GOD'S ORIGINAL PLAN, I BELIEVE, FOR JOSEPH. NEVERTHELESS, IT WAS BETTER THAN WHAT THE BROTHERS WERE WANTING TO DO TO HIM, KILLING HIM, AND SO GOD SOLD HIM INTO SLAVERY. BUT THE ANOINTING OF GOD WAS ON JOSEPH. JOSEPH HAD ALREADY BEEN SHOWN THROUGH THOSE TWO DREAMS 
that he was going to be exalted and that people would come bow down to him. And because of that, Joseph was still standing in faith, even though he was standing there stripped naked, being sold into slavery. Joseph was a prosperous man. You have to be able to see yourself the way that God sees you, and you have to see it on the inside before you see it on the outside. You know, back during those poverty days that I was describing just a few minutes ago, Jamie and I could have gone on welfare. We could have gotten uh, food stamps uh, for I probably the first 10 years of our marriage. We were that poor, and yet I never saw myself poor. I was preaching prosperity. I was preaching that God would supply my needs even though I couldn't see it in my life. I could see it to a degree, like we would have the doorbell ring and we'd go and nobody would be there and there'd be a sack of groceries and I'd look both ways down the street and I couldn't see anybody. Uh, God provided miracles. I mean, at the last moment, our finances had come through, but it was a struggle. And so I could see some VICTORY IN THIS AREA, BUT CERTAINLY I, NOBODY WOULD HAVE CALLED ME PROSPEROUS. WE WERE ACTUALLY EVICTED FROM uh, PLACES THAT WE LIVED BECAUSE WE COULDN'T PAY THE RENT. WE WERE THREATENED TO COME IN AND SEIZE ALL OF OUR STUFF. WE WERE STRUGGLING. I SAW ENOUGH SUPPLY THAT I KNEW THAT GOD WAS FOR ME. AND ANYWAY, EVEN THOUGH WE WERE STRUGGLING IN THE NATURAL, I NEVER SAW MYSELF POOR. I NEVER APPLIED FOR FOOD STAMPS. I NEVER DID THOSE THINGS, EVEN THOUGH I COULD HAVE. AND IT WASN'T THAT I WAS AFRAID TO DO IT OR I WAS EMBARRASSED TO DO IT. I HONESTLY DID NOT SEE MYSELF POOR. I SAW MYSELF BLESSED. I KNEW THAT GOD'S ANOINTING WAS ON ME. I KNEW I HAD A VISION FROM GOD THAT SOMEDAY I WOULD BE PROSPEROUS AND I WOULD BE DOING THINGS. AND I NEVER SAW MYSELF POOR, EVEN THOUGH WE WERE DEFINITELY POOR. I DIDN'T SEE MYSELF THAT WAY. THERE ARE PEOPLE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM RIGHT NOW THAT YOU MAY BE IN A SITUATION WHERE IN THE NATURAL YOU ARE POOR, BUT YOU DON'T HAVE TO SEE YOURSELF POOR. YOU COULD BE LIKE JOSEPH AND BE A PROSPEROUS MAN EVEN WHEN YOU'RE STANDING THERE STRIPPED NAKED BEING SOLD INTO SLAVERY. THERE MAY BE SOME OF YOU THAT IN THE NATURAL IT LOOKS LIKE YOU'RE DYING, BUT YOU DON'T HAVE TO SEE YOURSELF DYING. YOU CAN SEE YOURSELF THE HEALED. YOU CAN TAKE THE WORD OF GOD AND SEE YOURSELF THE WAY THAT GOD TELLS YOU YOU'RE, you're SUPPOSED TO BE. YOU COULD BE IN SITUATIONS WHERE IN THE NATURAL IT LOOKS LIKE THAT THERE'S NO PROMOTION, THAT THERE'S NO WAY THINGS ARE GOING TO WORK OUT, AND YET YOU CAN SEE YOURSELF A PROSPEROUS PERSON ON THE INSIDE. THERE'S SOME PEOPLE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM RIGHT NOW THAT THIS IS JUST CRAZY TO YOU. HOW CAN YOU SEE SOMETHING WHEN YOUR CIRCUMSTANCES ARE SAYING THAT? I'M SAYING THIS IN LOVE, BUT YOU'RE WHAT THE BIBLE CALLS CARNAL. MOST PEOPLE THINK CARNAL IS SOMETHING EVIL. IT'S TERRIBLE. WELL, IT IS BAD, BUT NOT ONLY, YOU KNOW, MURDER AND THINGS LIKE THAT ARE CARNAL, BUT WHEN YOU ARE JUST CONTROLLED BY WHAT YOU CAN SEE, TASTE, HEAR, SMELL, AND FEEL, YOUR FIVE SENSES, THAT'S WHAT THE BIBLE'S CALLING CARNAL. A PERSON WHO IS LIMITED TO ONLY uh, THINKING WHAT REALITY IS, IS WHAT YOU SEE, TASTE, HEAR, SMELL, AND FEEL, THIS NATURAL REALM. IF YOU'RE SPIRITUAL, YOU CAN GO BEYOND THE PHYSICAL THINGS THAT MAY LOOK CONTRARY, AND YOU CAN TAKE THE WORD OF GOD, AND YOU CAN HAVE A PICTURE PAINTED ON THE INSIDE OF YOU OF WHAT GOD WANTS TO DO IN YOUR LIFE, AND YOU CAN GRAB HOLD OF THAT, AND YOU CAN SEE YOURSELF PROSPEROUS WHEN THE WORLD SEES YOU A SLAVE. YOU CAN SEE YOURSELF HEALED WHEN THE WORLD SEES YOU SICK. BOY, THIS IS GREAT. I, AGAIN, I COULD TALK ABOUT THIS FOR A LONG TIME, BUT THIS IS ONE OF MY FAVORITE SCRIPTURES WHERE HERE'S JOSEPH BEING SOLD INTO SLAVERY, AND THE LORD SAYS, JOSEPH WAS A VERY PROSPEROUS MAN. DIDN'T SAY THAT ABOUT POTIPHAR. IF YOU'RE JUST LOOKING IN THE NATURAL, POTIPHAR WAS A THOUSAND TIMES, A MILLION TIMES MORE PROSPEROUS THAN JOSEPH. BUT IN GOD'S EYES, JOSEPH WAS THE PROSPEROUS PERSON, NOT POTIPHAR. YOU KNOW, IT REALLY DOESN'T MATTER WHAT ANYBODY ELSE THINKS ABOUT YOU. WHAT GOD THINKS ABOUT YOU IS WHAT'S IMPORTANT. YOU'VE GOT TO GET TO A PLACE WHERE YOU HAVE A RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD, YOU TAKE THE WORD OF GOD AND WHAT GOD SAYS ABOUT YOU, THAT YOU ARE THE RIGHTEOUSNESS OF GOD. YOU'VE GOT TO SEE YOURSELF THAT WAY REGARDLESS OF WHAT'S HAPPENED IN THE PAST. THERE ARE SOME PEOPLE THAT LET THEIR PAST JUST DOMINATE THEIR PRESENT, BUT WHEN YOU COME TO THE LORD, YOU BECOME A NEW CREATURE IN CHRIST JESUS, 2 CORINTHIANS 5, 17. OLD THINGS HAVE PASSED AWAY. ALL THINGS HAVE BECOME NEW, AND YOU ARE NOW CREATED IN RIGHTEOUSNESS AND TRUE HOLINESS, EPHESIANS 4, 24. JESUS HAS BECOME YOUR RIGHTEOUSNESS, AND YOU NEED TO SEE YOURSELF THE WAY THAT GOD SEES YOU. 
You don't need to limp through life always burdened down and bearing shame by what you've done before you came to the Lord. You're a brand new person and you need to see yourself that way. And this is what happened to Joseph. You know, again, this story, I'm reading between the lines, but I believe that these things are absolutely true. If you would meditate on it, you can see it because it goes on to say in the next verse, in verse 3, it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. This wasn't something that had no bearing on reality. It, it, was to, it was, wasn't disconnected from reality because Joseph saw himself prosperous, because he knew that God was with him, because he had this vision that someday he was going to be exalted and people would come and bow down to him. Because of that, Joseph was still trusting God and believing God and submitted to God. And it was so obvious that his master, Potiphar, who bought him, saw that God was with him. I tell you, if you can see it on the inside, it will eventually begin to manifest itself on the outside and other people will see it. There's some people that are probably skeptics that are watching this program and thinking, you're just in la-la land. You're thinking that if you just see yourself this way and, and you're, you're going to live the rest of your life and live a total defeated life and yet you just see yourself differently on the inside. That's the way a skeptic would look at it. But I'm telling you that if you truly embrace God's plan for your life, and if you truly see it on the inside, it will manifest itself on the outside. Just like Potiphar, he saw that Joseph was blessed and whatever he set his hand unto, uh, God would make it to prosper in his hand. And so because of that, in verse 4, it says, And Joseph found grace in his sight, talking about Potiphar's sight, his master, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hands. Again, you don't do this to a person who's going around griping and complaining and murmuring and just bitter and depressed and discouraged because of the bad things that have happened to him. You don't put a person like that in charge of your whole household. And it goes on to say, so that he didn't even know anything that was going on. He trusted Joseph so much that he didn't even know what was going on. Just the food that he ate is about all that he had to do. In verse 5, it says, It came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer over his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. You don't put a person in charge like that. And this says that he didn't know anything about his business, about his finances. The only thing that Potiphar knew was the bread that he ate. He trusted Joseph that much. You don't do that to a person who's griping and complaining and depressed and sitting there sucking his thumb and talking about how everything's against him. And I'm saying this in love again, but there are some people that you've had some bad things happen to you. You might have caused them. You might not have caused them. Maybe they were things that were done to you without your cooperation. I don't know. But if you are responding negatively to it and if you've let these negative circumstances depress you and make you to where you have no hope for the future and you're just sitting there murmuring and complaining, you have become a victim, not a victor. But it doesn't matter what anybody else has done to you. You always have a choice of whether you become bitter or better. And I know that I'm, some people are really being offended by what I'm saying because it's like I'm not embracing your situation. I'm coming against your feelings of failure and depression, and you feel justified in doing all of that. But I tell you, if you do that, you'll never get promoted. You'll never get out of that situation. You are letting your circumstances dominate you. You can go to the Word of God, especially those of you who've made Jesus your Lord. I guarantee you, Jesus has a path plotted out of the situation you are in to total victory. And it doesn't matter what's happened. It doesn't matter how bad it is. You may think your situation is worse than everybody else, but see, that's one of the problems because it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. 
BUT GOD IS FAITHFUL, WHO WILL NOT SUFFER YOU TO BE TEMPTED ABOVE THAT YOU ARE ABLE, BUT WILL WITH THE TEMPTATION MAKE A WAY TO ESCAPE THAT YOU MAY BE ABLE TO BEAR IT. SO IF YOU'RE SITTING THERE FEELING TOTALLY HOPELESS AND HELPLESS AND YOU'RE FEELING JUSTIFIED IN BEING DEPRESSED, THEN YOU HAVE VIOLATED THAT SCRIPTURE. YOU'VE GIVEN AWAY YOUR HOPE. YOU NEED TO COME BACK TO A PLACE TO WHERE YOU SAY, GOD, I DON'T CARE WHAT HAPPENS. THE BIBLE SAYS IN ISAIAH 54, 17, NO WEAPON THAT IS FORMED AGAINST ME SHALL PROSPER, AND EVERY TONGUE THAT SHALL RISE AGAINST ME IN JUDGMENT I SHALL CONDEMN. THIS IS THE HERITAGE OF THE SERVANTS OF THE LORD, AND MY RIGHTEOUSNESS IS OF YOU, THUS SAITH THE LORD. AND SO YOU NEED TO GET THAT ATTITUDE, AND YOU NEED TO RECOGNIZE IT DOESN'T MATTER WHAT HAS HAPPENED TO YOU, GOD HAS A PATH PLANNED OUT OF THAT SITUATION INTO TOTAL VICTORY. PRAISE GOD. MAN, I JUST KNOW IN MY HEART THAT GOD IS SPEAKING TO MANY PEOPLE. THIS IS BRINGING YOU OUT OF THAT FUNK THAT YOU'RE IN. YOU NEED TO GET OVER IT, AND YOU NEED TO BE LIKE JOSEPH. HE HAD BEEN THE FAVORITE SON. HE WAS RAISED IN WEALTH. NOW HE IS A SLAVE. It, MOST PEOPLE WOULD HAVE JUSTIFIED HIM SITTING DOWN AND JUST GIVING UP. WHAT'S THE USE? WHAT'S THE PURPOSE IN DREAMS? LOOK WHERE IT'S GOT ME. BUT NO, HE HELD ON TO THAT VISION, AND IT SAYS THAT HE SERVED POTIPHAR. MOST PEOPLE THAT ARE REALLY DEPRESSED, THEY DON'T SERVE ANYBODY ELSE. THEY JUST, un, they just UNPLUG, THEY uh, CHECK OUT OF SOCIETY, AND THEY'RE JUST SITTING THERE IN THE DARK, NURSING ALL OF THEIR HURTS AND PAINS. I'M TELLING YOU, THE WAY OUT IS FOR YOU TO SERVE SOMEBODY ELSE, FOR YOU TO TAKE. I DON'T CARE WHAT'S COME AGAINST YOU. you THERE'S STILL SOMETHING YOU CAN DO. YOU COULD STILL BE A BLESSING TO SOMEBODY, AND YOU JUST START SERVING PEOPLE, AND YOU SAY, I'M NOT GOING TO BE IN THIS SITUATION FOREVER. AND YOU MAY NOT BE ABLE TO DO THE GREAT THINGS, BUT YOU CAN DO SOMETHING. AND YOU START SERVING. YOU START BLESSING OTHER PEOPLE. GET OUT OF JUST FOCUSING ON YOURSELF AND THINKING ABOUT YOUR PROBLEM AND GO TO THINKING ABOUT SOMEBODY ELSE. THIS IS WHAT JOSEPH DID. IN A SITUATION THAT MOST PEOPLE WOULD HAVE GIVEN UP, HE WAS SERVING POTIPHAR, AND BECAUSE OF IT, POTIPHAR PROMOTED HIM. AND SO HE WAS BEGINNING TO SEE SUCCESS. HE WAS BEGINNING TO SEE SOME GOOD THINGS, BUT THE DEVIL DIDN'T JUST ROLL OVER AND PLAY DEAD BECAUSE HE ENDURED THE VERY FIRST THING THAT WAS THROWN AT HIM. NOW THE MASTER'S WIFE CAME AGAINST HIM. YOU KNOW, WE JUST READ IT RIGHT HERE. IT SAYS THAT HE WAS A GOODLY PERSON AND WELL-FAVORED. THAT'S KING JAMES ENGLISH FOR SAYING HE WAS A VERY HANDSOME MAN. HE WAS, he was a, YOU KNOW, A GOOD-LOOKING GUY. AND BECAUSE OF THAT, THE NEXT VERSE SAYS IT CAME TO PASS AFTER THESE THINGS, HIS MASTER'S WIFE CAST HER EYES UPON JOSEPH, AND SHE SAID, LIE WITH ME, TALKING ABOUT HAVING SEXUAL RELATIONSHIP. BUT HE REFUSED AND SAID UNTO HIS MASTER'S WIFE, BEHOLD, MY MASTER WANTETH NOT WHAT IS WITH ME IN THE HOUSE, AND HE HATH COMMITTED ALL THAT HE HATH TO MY HAND. THERE IS NONE GREATER IN HIS HOUSE THAN I, NEITHER HATH HE KEPT BACK FROM ME ANYTHING BUT THEE, BECAUSE THOU ART HIS WIFE. HOW THEN CAN I DO THIS GREAT WICKEDNESS AND SIN AGAINST GOD. BOY, THIS IS ONE OF THE PASSAGES OF SCRIPTURE THAT THE LORD HAS USED IN MY LIFE BIG TIME. I'M NOT GOING TO BE ABLE TO SAY EVERYTHING I WANT TO SAY ABOUT THIS ON TODAY'S PROGRAM. I'M GOING TO CONTINUE THIS INTO TOMORROW'S PROGRAM. BUT LET ME JUST SAY THAT JUST BECAUSE JOSEPH WAS ABLE TO ENDURE THE MISTREATMENT FROM HIS BROTHERS, BEING SOLD INTO SLAVERY, AND NOW HERE HE'S A, a SLAVE, AND HE HAD, he had FALLEN FROM BEING a, a, THE FAVORITE SON OF A WEALTHY PERSON TO NOW BEING A SLAVE. EVEN THOUGH HE HAD ENDURED THAT, THAT DIDN'T MEAN THAT THE TEST WAS OVER. SATAN WILL THROW WAVE AFTER WAVE AFTER WAVE OF THINGS AT YOU. SOME PEOPLE MIGHT STAND ONE TIME BECAUSE THEY'VE GOT A VISION THAT THEY THINK THAT THEY CAN GO THROUGH THIS AND THAT THEY'RE, they're GOING TO COME OUT BETTER ON THE OTHER SIDE. BUT THERE'S VERY FEW PEOPLE THAT WILL STAND WAVE AFTER WAVE AFTER WAVE, ASSAULT AFTER ASSAULT AFTER ASSAULT OF THE DEVIL. YOU KNOW, THE SCRIPTURE TALKS ABOUT YOU'VE GOT TO HAVE PATIENCE AND LET PATIENCE HAVE HER PERFECT WORK THAT YOU MAY BE PERFECT AND ENTIRE WANTING NOTHING. YOU CAN'T PUT LIMITS ON THINGS. I'VE KNOWN PEOPLE THAT SAYS, ALL RIGHT, I'M GOING TO STAND, AND AS LONG AS IT'S MINOR THINGS THAT COME AGAINST ME, AS LONG AS IT'S TEMPORARY THINGS, AS LONG AS IT'S A SHORT DURATION, OF STRUGGLE THAT I HAVE TO GO THROUGH, THEN THEY WILL STAND THROUGH THAT. BUT THEY HAVE LIMITS TO HOW FAR THEY WILL GO. DID YOU KNOW IF YOU HAVE A LIMIT ON HOW MUCH uh, OPPOSITION YOU'RE GOING TO ENDURE, 
SATAN WILL PUSH YOU TO THAT LIMIT EVERY TIME. HE KNOWS WHERE YOUR LIMITS ARE. HE KNOWS WHERE YOU'RE READY TO JUST QUIT AND THROW IN THE TOWEL AND GIVE IN. AND HE WILL PUSH YOU UNTIL THE VERY BRINK OF THAT. IT'S ACTUALLY TO YOUR ADVANTAGE JUST TO MAKE A DECISION THAT, YOU KNOW WHAT? THERE ARE NO LIMITS. I AM NOT GOING TO QUIT. I DON'T CARE WHAT HAPPENS. WHEN YOU DO THAT, YOU ACTUALLY WILL SEE A BREAKTHROUGH QUICKER BECAUSE SATAN WILL KNOW THAT HE HADN'T GOT A CHANCE AND SATAN AT HEART IS A COWARD. THE ONLY REASON HE'LL FIGHT YOU IS IF HE THINKS HE'S GOT A CHANCE OF YOU GIVING IN. AND SO JOSEPH DIDN'T JUST STAND THROUGH, YOU KNOW, THE BROTHER'S REJECTION AND THEN BEING SOLD INTO SLAVERY, BUT BOY, HE STOOD EVEN WHEN HE WAS AGAIN PROMOTED TO ANOTHER POSITION. HERE COMES A MASTER'S WIFE TRYING TO SEDUCE... WELCOME TO OUR FRIDAY'S BROADCAST OF THE GOSPEL TRUTH. TODAY IS THE END OF MY FIRST WEEK TEACHING THROUGH THE LIFE OF JOSEPH. I'VE GOT A NEW BOOK, FIRST TIME WE'VE EVER RELEASED THIS, ENTITLED LESSONS FROM JOSEPH. YOU KNOW, I'VE GOT ANOTHER TEACHING ON uh, LESSONS FROM ELIJAH AND ANOTHER ONE ENTITLED LESSONS FROM DAVID. AND SO THIS IS LESSONS FROM JOSEPH. AND I TELL YOU, I JUST LOVE uh, JOSEPH. GOD HAS SPOKEN SOME POWERFUL THINGS TO ME THROUGH HIS LIFE. AND I USED THE VERY FIRST DAY OF THIS WEEK TALKING ABOUT 1 CORINTHIANS 10, 6 THROUGH 11, THAT THE REASON ALL OF THESE THINGS WERE WRITTEN IN THE BIBLE IS FOR OUR LEARNING, THAT WE MAY LEARN THROUGH THEM NOT TO MAKE THE SAME MISTAKES THAT THEY MADE AND THEN TO EMULATE THEM ON THE THINGS THAT THEY DID RIGHT. IF YOU DON'T FOLLOW THE LEADERSHIP OF THE PEOPLE uh, IN THE BIBLE THAT WERE WRITTEN ABOUT, WELL, THEN YOU ARE DESTINED TO HAVE TO LEARN ALL OF THESE THINGS THROUGH YOUR OWN HARD KNOCKS. THERE'S A BETTER WAY. I'VE ALSO GOT THIS LITTLE BOOKLET THAT IS A 50-PAGE BOOKLET THAT'S A BRIEF SUMMARY OF THIS TEACHING, AND WE'RE GIVING THIS AWAY AS A GIFT. Uh, with no, NOTHING REQUESTED FOR THAT, AND FOR THE BOOK WE'RE ASKING FOR A DONATION OF ANY AMOUNT. AND THEN WE HAVE CD'S AND DVD'S AND A USB ON THIS TEACHING, AND WE'LL GIVE OUT ALL THAT INFORMATION AT THE END OF TODAY'S PROGRAM. SO WE'VE ALREADY COVERED A LOT OF MATERIAL THIS WEEK. WE TALKED IN GENESIS CHAPTER 37 ABOUT HOW JOSEPH HAD THESE TWO DREAMS THAT INSTILLED A HOPE IN HIM, A VISION FOR HIS FUTURE, WHICH WAS GOING TO BE NEEDED BECAUSE HE WAS GOING TO GO THROUGH A LOT OF BAD THINGS. HIS BROTHERS HATED HIM. THEY TRIED TO KILL HIM, AND ONE OF THE BROTHERS, REUBEN, SAVED THEM FROM KILLING HIM, BUT THEN THE OTHER BROTHER STILL SOLD HIM INTO SLAVERY. SO HERE'S THIS BOY WHO WAS THE FAVORITE SON OF A VERY RICH MAN. HE WENT FROM BEING, I MEAN, JUST PAMPERED IN EVERY WAY TO SOLD INTO SLAVERY AND I MENTIONED THIS ON YESTERDAY'S PROGRAM, BUT I LOVE THIS VERSE IN GENESIS 39, TOO. IT SAYS, THE LORD WAS WITH JOSEPH, AND HE WAS A PROSPEROUS MAN. THAT'S TALKING ABOUT WHEN HE WAS BEING SOLD INTO SLAVERY. GOD SAW HIM PROSPEROUS, EVEN THOUGH IN THE NATURAL, THERE WAS NOTHING PROSPEROUS ABOUT HIM. IT LOOKED LIKE HIS LIFE WAS OVER. DID YOU KNOW THAT YOU CAN GET GOD'S OPINION OF YOU, GOD'S VISION OF YOU, AND WHAT HE WANTS TO DO THROUGH YOU IN THE FUTURE, AND YOU CAN LET THAT uh, ENCOURAGE YOU AND KEEP YOU STRONG EVEN WHEN EVERYTHING IN THE NATURAL LOOKS COMPLETELY CONTRARY TO THAT. MAN, THAT IS ONE POWERFUL TRUTH. AND BECAUSE JOSEPH KEPT A GOOD ATTITUDE, YOU DON'T FIND PEOPLE WHO ARE JUST DEPRESSED AND DISCOURAGED AND BITTER AND ANGRY ACTING THE WAY JOSEPH DID. SO HIS VERY ACTIONS HERE SHOW YOU THAT EVEN THOUGH HIS BROTHERS HAD FORSAKEN HIM, EVEN THOUGH HE WAS SOLD INTO SLAVERY, EVEN THOUGH IT LOOKED LIKE HIS LIFE WAS OVER, IN THE NATURAL. HE CONTINUED TO BELIEVE GOD, AND HE HELD ON TO THOSE DREAMS THAT GOD HAD GIVEN HIM, AND HE SERVED HIS MASTER, AND HE WAS SO SUCCESSFUL THAT HIS MASTER PROMOTED HIM TO BEING LORD OVER HIS WHOLE HOUSE. HE DIDN'T KNOW ANYTHING ABOUT HIS FINANCES, HIS BUSINESS DEALS. IT SAYS HE DIDN'T KNOW ANYTHING THAT WAS GOING ON EXCEPT WHAT HE ATE. THAT'S HOW MUCH HE TRUSTED JOSEPH. HE PUT JOSEPH IN CHARGE OF HIS ENTIRE HOUSEHOLD AND ALL OF THE OTHER SLAVES. BOY, THAT SPEAKS VOLUMES. THAT SPEAKS VOLUMES. A DEPRESSED, DEFEATED PERSON, A PERSON WHO'S MURMURING AND COMPLAINING DOES NOT GET PROMOTED THAT WAY. SO THIS SHOWS US THAT JOSEPH WAS STILL HOLDING ON TO HIS INTEGRITY. HE WAS STILL SERVING GOD AND HE WAS SERVING HIS MASTER. HE COULD HAVE BEEN BITTER TOWARDS HIM, THINKING, I USED TO BE THE ONE WHO HAD SLAVES. NOW I'M A SLAVE. AND HE COULD HAVE BEEN BITTER TOWARDS HIS MASTER, AND YET HE WASN'T. BUT JUST BECAUSE HE WAS DOING THE RIGHT THING DOESN'T MEAN THAT THE DEVIL'S GOING TO LEAVE YOU ALONE. NOW THE DEVIL CAME AT JOSEPH THROUGH THE MASTER'S WIFE, AND SHE TEMPTED HIM AND SAID, LIE WITH ME. THAT'S THE LAST PART 
of verse 7 and in verse 8, but he refused. Joseph refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Boy, there is some powerful things here that the Lord spoke to me. There's two things I want to point out. I could spend more time on this, but first of all, he recognized the honor and the authority that had been given him by Potiphar. And you know, again, if he was a bitter person, he could have said, I'm a slave and he's my master and he could have hated him. And yet that's not what he did. He served him and he honored his master and he was not going to sin against his master. Did you know today there are so many people that you know America, well, the whole world has had a history of slavery. And uh, in America, there was a lot of slaves. And there are people that look back and just think that you're supposed to hate any person that ever had slaves. And yet uh, in the Bible, it says that the, it, Paul gave command to slaves to serve their masters without grudging and without you know, being a man pleaser. In other words, you do it as heartily as unto the Lord. And yet there's some people today that, man, if somebody was to treat them unjustly, they feel justified in hating that person, slandering that person, doing anything to that person. That's not a godly attitude. Now, that's not to say that every situation, a God wants you to just submit to it, but there are right and wrong ways to do things. And you see here Joseph submitting to his master, and he would not take advantage of his master. He said this would be a sin against his master, and he wouldn't do it. Did you know he could have gotten by with it? The wife wasn't going to tell on him because it would have been her own neck that would have been on the chopping block. He could have rationalized. If he would have been like many people today, there's people watching this program that it, bad things happen to you and that just makes you so bitter that it, in your eyes it justifies you going out and uh, rioting and breaking windows and doing things, setting cars on fire, stuff like that, and you just think that you deserve it because you've been mistreated. Joseph had been mistreated, but he wasn't going to do those kind of things. He could have gotten by with having sex with the master's wife because she wouldn't have told on him. He could have looked at it as, I deserve it. Look at all the bad things that have happened to me. Here's an opportunity for me to indulge my flesh. But see, he was being faithful to that master. Man, that, that speaks volumes about Joseph. And then the thing that really speaks to me the most out of this, after he talked about being faithful to Potiphar and not violating Potiphar, then he said in the latter part of this ninth verse, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's the bottom line. You need to honor people. You need to be faithful to the people who've entrusted you and given you a position. If you're working for somebody, you don't need to take an extra 10 minutes on breaks. You need to honor that employee. You don't need to steal pencils and pens and little things that you know you think that you can get by with. That's not being faithful. You need to serve that person that you're working for the same as if you were the boss. But the bottom line is, how could you do this great wickedness and sin against God? You know, when I was in Vietnam, there was a guy that I went to, I grew up with. We weren't real close, but we went to church together. We were in school together. Uh, we, we had known each other our whole life, and both of us got drafted. Both of us were in Vietnam at the same time. And I tell you, in Vietnam, there was a lot of pressure on you. Uh, there was a pressure to be accepted. Everybody was doing drugs. Everybody was drinking. And they would have what they called a stand down. And like every 90 days or so, they would take the troops out of the field and put you into a rear area and bring in these Filipino showgirls and they would dance. And uh, they were actually prostitutes. And after the show was over, you could have as much sex as you wanted. The government would give you as much booze as you wanted. Everybody got totally wasted during these three days of stand down. And even though, man, that was not what I wanted to do, there was a draw to be a part of, of what everybody else was doing. And as far as I know, I was the only person out of 200 people in my 
uh, in my battalion, I guess it was, uh, I was the only person that didn't participate. And you know what? This other friend of mine that I grew up with, he had basically the same values that I had. He grew up the same way, and yet he participated. And he got sucked into all of that stuff. And I can tell you, part of the reasoning was people were thinking, well, who's going to know? You know, if you were back here in the States and if you were having sexual uh, relations with somebody outside of marriage, you might think about how's this going to reflect on my family or something like that. But in Vietnam, I was the only person out of 200 people that didn't do this. Nobody was going to criticize me. There's no way that it would ever come back to what to my family. And it looked like I could get by with it. But you know the thing that kept me from doing that? If it would have only been my desire to, you know, just blend in and be a part and be accepted by people, I'd have given in to that. But the thing that kept me from doing that was the fact that I had a relationship with God, a real vital relationship with God. And it didn't matter what people said. People made fun of me. People criticized me. I had people that get, get so upset, I'd go sit down, you know, when I got my food in a mess hall, and all of the people around me would just get up and move. They treated me like the plague. They called me preacher and they joked about me and stuff like that. And even though I didn't like that and I didn't enjoy those things, I guarantee you it was my relationship with the Lord that kept me from doing that. I actually spoke at a Christian high school one time. There was about 600 people in this high school and they had me speak to their classes. And while I was waiting to be introduced, I just picked up one of their brochures, and on the brochure it said, Positive Peer Pressure. And as I read it, this was the main thing that they were advertising, that kids, you know, love to be accepted. Uh, God made us for acceptance. I believe any person that likes rejection, something's wrong with you. God made us for fellowship. And so there's something inside of every person that wants to be accepted. And because of this... Kids will often be pressured into experimenting with drugs, alcohol, sex, and things like this that they really don't want to do. It's not the way they were raised, but peer pressure will cause them to do it. So this Christian school was advertising as one of their greatest promotion pieces, positive peer pressure. Because it was a Christian school and most of the kids there love God, well, then you were under pressure to live a godly life instead of to go out and experiment with drugs and alcohol, etc. And I understood the point that they were making, but I firmly believe that that's still wrong. You are teaching those kids to conform to peer pressure. And because it's positive peer pressures, that might help them through high school or whatever, but what happens when they get uh, sent into battle? Like I was over in Vietnam and I was the only person that didn't submit. If I would have been trained, even with positive peer pressure, but if I was taught to give in to peer pressure, I guarantee you I would have committed all of the atrocities that everybody else did. But it was because of my personal relationship with the Lord. You shouldn't be training your kids to, you know, have peer pressure. Yes, you can use positive peer pressure. Yes, they need to have godly friends, and I wouldn't just expose them to all the negative peer pressure. But man, it needs to go far beyond that. And see, I get that from Joseph. Joseph was in a situation where probably everybody else around him was living this way. Probably all of the other slaves in Potiphar's house, if they would have been presented with the opportunity to have sex with the master's wife, that would have moved them up the ladder and the master's wife wouldn't have uh, exposed what was happening and most everybody else would have taken advantage of it. But Joseph did it because, number one, he honored Potiphar. He was actually uh, committed to doing what was right for him, and he was honoring the person who was over him. But the bottom line is, how could he do this great wickedness and sin against God? Man, that's powerful. You need to get to a place to when nobody's looking, you're still going to do what's right because of your relationship with God. There's not very many people that their relationship with God is deep enough to cause that to be the primary directive in their life. You know, I, I read a thing in Reader's Digest that they took a billfold and put $100 in it, and, but they also had a person's name. They had contact information, phone number, everything in there. And then they put this billfold 
in front of a place where there was a lot of traffic and they had a hidden, hidden camera and people that were hiding and they watched to see what people would do. And they said out of all of those people that saw this wallet, they did this over and over and over, there was like 80 or 90% of the people that would look inside, see the money, see the contact information, and then they would look to see if anybody was watching. And if nobody was watching, they would just take off and take the money. And then they would stop them and say, there was contact information. We planted this. Why didn't you make an effort to contact the person? And nearly every single person says, well, I thought about it, but I looked and it didn't look like anybody was going to hold me accountable. I could get away with it. And so they have situational ethics. It all depends on whether or not they're going to be caught, whether or not they're going to be punished for it or not. See, that's not the way you're supposed to live your life. You need to recognize that whether anybody else knows, whether anybody else is watching, God is with you constantly. The Lord knows every single thing. It says in Psalms 139 that there is not even a thought that you have in your head, but what God knows every single thought that you have. You need to get to where you live your life in total, uh, I mean, just being open and available to the Lord, recognizing that you don't have a Christian part of your life and then a secular part of your life. You need to get to where God is, is the number one thing in your life. And I'm speaking to the potential of 5.2 billion people. There's probably millions, multiple millions of people watching this. And out of all of those millions, I would suspect that the vast majority of you, and again, I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm just saying it to make my point that the vast majority of you do not live your life that way. It just depends. If you had to, you know, bend the truth in order to be able to sell your product, if you have to stab somebody else in the back, take advantage of somebody else to get a promotion in your, in your business, and on and on, it just depends on what the costs are as to what you would do. And that's the wrong way to live. You know, John Adams said that duty is ours and results are the Lord's. And he was the first vice president, the second president of the United States. And he was talking about the Revolutionary War. And it was in response to somebody saying, do you think we're going to win? And he basically was saying, it doesn't matter whether we win or not. We've got to do the right thing. And then duty is ours, results are the Lord's. You know, I had some people talk about that they felt like uh, the election with Trump and Biden was stolen. And because of that, they feel like, what's the use in voting? And I actually had David and Tim Barton on my program and we were addressing this very issue. And there was a person that called in, what's the point in voting? If our votes aren't gonna be counted right, if they're gonna stack the deck, if this dominion voting system is skewing the vote, what's the point in even trying? And boy, I thought David Barton's answer was just tremendous because he says, God is going to hold you accountable for you doing the right thing. And if other people, even if, you, if your vote never counted, you are going to be held accountable for the fact that you are given this privilege, this right, this responsibility to vote. And whether or not other people overwhelm it or whatever, God, you're going to have to answer for God for what did you do? See, that's his same attitude. Whether, whether what you do is, is rewarded or rebuffed, it doesn't matter. You need to do what's right. And this is what Joseph did. And this is one of the things that makes me admire him so much is that he didn't consider what the consequences were going to be. He did what was right regardless of the consequences. You know, I had a man just come to me yesterday and he's one of our students and he works at Walmart and Walmart allows the transgender uh, people to go into whichever restroom they feel like. Well, this man works at Walmart. His wife also works at Walmart and he refuses to let one, some of these transgender go into the women's restroom and he sits there and he defends and and protects his wife when she goes to the restroom. He's, he's an ex-military guy and he's not going to let this happen. And because of it, uh, he's possibly going to be fired. And he was asking me, what do I do? And I, and I basically was telling him the same thing. You have to do what's right 
And if it that doesn't matter what the results are, if it gets you fired, then get fired. God will reward you. God will take care of you. There's no person that gives up anything for his sake, is what it says in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. There's nobody who gives up anything for the Lord's sake, but what you will receive a hundredfold in this life, not just in the one to come, but in this life. If you wind up doing the right thing and you lose your job, I guarantee you God will bless you and prosper you and you'll come out better on the other side. We need to get rid of evaluating whether we should do something on what the consequences are going to be. You need to just evaluate on, is this going to please God? Is this what God wants me to do? And if it pleases God, then you do it. I don't care if it hair lips the devil. I don't care what the results is. And you know, this is exactly what I did during the COVID thing. We submitted for a brief period of time because President Trump said just two weeks to flatten the curve. And we didn't know where this was going. I didn't know. And so anyway, I obeyed for a short period of time. But then I just recognized that they were just going to milk this thing and extend it. And they did not have the right. You know, our facility, we could accommodate 5,000 people in different places with closed circuit. And they only allowed me to, I think, 75 people in our whole deal. And I just wrote the governor and I said, no way. I said, I'm not submitting. And he threatened to arrest me. And he threatened to come and take away my 501c3. They threatened to put me in jail. We had people come here and treat us like we were criminals. And my wife says, I hate this. And I hated it too. But you know what? This is exactly what drives me right here. What is the right thing to do? If you empower government and, and submit to them and give them authority that they don't have, that the Constitution doesn't have, I guarantee you they aren't going to just turn around and give it back to you. You have to take a stand. And so I stood because it was the right thing. And it was possible that it could have ended our ministry. It could have put me in jail. It could have done a lot of things. And I didn't like any of those uh, options. But, you know, I just was, what am I going to do? I am committed to doing what's right. And I'm going to do what's right. I don't care what the results are. That's what Joseph did. I get that from Joseph. You don't have to wait until you're in a crisis situation and they're threatening to fire you if you don't comply with their DEI and all of this CRT uh, stuff. You don't have to wait and make your decision then. You can make your decision right now that, God, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to speak the truth. I am not going to live a lie. I'm not going to call a man by his preferred female name. I'm not going to do that. That's validating a lie. I'm not going to do those kind of things. You can make a decision way before you come into that situation that you're just going to do what's right. And whatever the results are, duty is yours, results are God's. And I tell you, it's a great way to live. You don't have to sit there and agonize over things. What should I do? I'm just going to do what God told me to do. I'm going to live by the Word of God. I'm going to live by truth. I'm not going to embrace a lie. I will not promote a lie. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I started a week ago talking about lessons from Joseph. I've got a brand new book out on this. First time we've released this. This is a 200 page book and we're asking for a donation of any amount. I don't want to deny people getting this and so you send something and we'll send it to you. We have a suggested donation. But then here's a brief summary of that book. And this is just a 50 page book. We're giving this away as a gift to you. So you can get that if for some reason you could not or would not uh, get the larger book. And then we also have CDs and DVDs that were taken from a television program. And we also have a USB that will have the CD and USB and the DVDs 
on there. And we'll give out all of that information at the end of the program today. I've already covered a lot of material about Joseph, and we're now in Genesis chapter 39, where Joseph was sold into slavery, and yet he was a prosperous man in the size of in the eyes of the Lord. Man, I made a big point out of that. That really ministers to me. You got to see yourself the way that God sees you, not the way that other people see you, and many times not even the way you see yourself. You got to get an image of you doing what God called you to do. And so he served Potiphar, and because of it, Potiphar promoted him. You don't promote people who are bit miserable, bitter, angry, uh, upset, sucking their thumb, complaining about how life is treating them. This says volumes about Joseph. He was a faithful man, and here he was, rejected by his family. While most people would just be crushed by this, Joseph was still prosperous and he was still trusting God. Because of it, he was promoted. And then the master's wife tried to seduce him and get him to have sexual relationships with her. And he refused that because he honored his master, a person that was oppressing him, a person who had bought him and turned him into property. There's many people today that would be so offended by that that they would never do anything to help this person. Joseph honored his master and would not sin against him. And he respected his master and the honor that his master had given him. Boy, that's really good. You know, in the New Testament, it says, servants, obey them that are over you, not only the good and gentle, but also the forward, those who are misusing their power. This would translate to us today to about serving a person who's uh, over you in a, in a business, like your boss or manager. And some of them don't treat you right, but you still ought to treat them right. You ought to do the right thing. And if you'll do that, God will promote you. So he would not yield to his master's wife seduction because he honored his master. But the main thing, and this is what I really emphasized on last Friday's program is, he says, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And man, that has, that has become a major uh, influence in my life. I've just determined that I'm going to do what's right in the sight of God, not based on whether it gets, uh, whether I could get by with it, whether anybody will know about it. That's not, that's not what motivates me. I do what's right in the sight of God. You know, when I'm out on the road, I'll have people give me money. Sometimes it's just a dollar or something, and they'll give it personally to me. But I was, I was at one meeting this last year where I forgot the exact figures, but I had people give me something like twelve or $15,000 that was cash that was just put in my hand. Did you know, according to the way most people do that, I could just take that. But that I don't believe that that's the way that God would want me to do things. So I put it into the ministry. They didn't say that I had to put it into the ministry. It was personal gifts to me. Now, if a person tells me that I do not want this to go into the ministry, this is a personal gift to you, I might accept that. But I'm saying I could take a lot of money kind of, in a sense, under the table and do things like that. But that's not what I believe God wants me to do. And so you have to get to where you do what's right, not whether you can get by with it, whether you are ever going to be held accountable to it. God is going to hold you accountable. And that's just a major, major influence in my life. So he refused to submit to the master's wife's seduction. And in verse 10, it says, And it came to pass as she spake, this is talking about the master's wife, spake to Joseph day by day, trying to seduce him that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Here's another great thing. Joseph is just a great example. And he had this great attitude. He, he was serving his master. He refused these, this uh, seduction by the master's wife. And it says day by day she tried to wear him down, but he wouldn't uh, agree to have sexual relationships with her or to be with her. Again, this is a great principle. The scripture says you flee fornication. You resist the devil, James 4, 7, but you flee fornication. You can't get away from the devil. So you can't flee from the devil. You have to resist the devil. But there are things you can get away from, and one of them is fornication. You, you have to flee fornication is what the scripture says. Joseph here, he wouldn't even be with her. He avoided being with this woman. 
because he knew that she was trying to seduce him. There are so many Christians that if you could imagine this, that like, like here's a line, draw right here, and over there is sin, and over here is doing the right thing. There's so many Christians that they, won't, they don't want to get into sin, but they'll get as close to it as they can. It's like they're walking this line, and if they just have a slightest little puff of wind come, it could blow them over into that thing. But man, I do it the opposite. Like if here's sin, man, I'm going to get as far over here so that I couldn't trip and fall across that line. There's a lot of people that will flirt with sin. There's people that will put themselves in embarrassing situations, in situations where even if they don't sin, it could be construed as sin. The scripture says, Paul was talking about uh, handling money, and he said, we provide for things honest, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of man. So it's not a matter of you just doing the right thing in the sight of God. You need to do the right thing in the sight of man. You know, because of that, I, I will not go someplace with a woman by herself. If she needs counseling or something, I have a, an uh, executive assistant that always sits in with me if I ever talk to a woman. I would not ride somewhere with a woman. Maybe if it's across the street or, you know, there might be some exception, but I'm not going to take a trip with a woman. I'm going to do things that not only are honest, but are couldn't be construed as being immodest or wrong in some way. And this is what Joseph did. See, he wouldn't even submit to her. He didn't lie with her, but he also wouldn't even be seen with her. He avoided her as much as he could. Man, there's a great lesson to learn in this. You need to learn this. I had a pastor of a church that was a large church. He had multiple campuses. And he told me that, you know, he will never counsel a woman alone. And he would never counsel a woman more than one time because if the woman came in, like if she was having marital problems, most of the time it's because she's spiritual, seeking the Lord. The husband's not spiritual. So, so here she comes and talks to a man who is considered spiritual, everything she wished her husband was, and they're talking about this. And it's just like striking a match next to, you know, uh, gasoline or something like that. It's just a matter of time until it explodes. And because of that, man, we have made some decisions. Did you know on our doors in our uh, offices, we have a lot of cubicles, but the offices that have a door, there's also a slit on it so that you can see in, so that you, you can't go in there and take a, a person of the opposite sex in there and, and be doing something. We've done a lot of things just to avoid the appearance of evil. And this is what Joseph did. I learned this from Joseph. There's other examples in the Bible, but this is one of the main things that I learned this right here. So he wouldn't even consent to be with her. And in verse 11, it says, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house therein. And so in other words, he, he avoided being with her, but this time he was doing something that he was uh, committed to do. So he was just doing what he had to do to carry on his business. And it says in verse 12 that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Man, Joseph wasn't going to have any part of this. He wasn't diplomatic about it. Man, he fled from that woman like she was the plague. And uh, you might question whether he should have taken his garment with him, but we don't know exactly what happened. She probably had hold of it and wouldn't let go. And so he just decided, I'll let you have the garment, but you aren't going to have me. And he fled. And look at this. It says in verse 13, And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled forth, that she called unto him the man of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, ye, uh, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up the garment by her until her Lord came home. In other words, th here's another thing to learn through this. She said that she loved him. I'm sure that she tried to make this look great. And, oh, I just love you. I'm so passionate about you. I've got to have this relationship. But it wasn't love. It was lust. And you can prove it because when she didn't get her way, her love turned into hatred. 
Did you know David had a son, Amnon, who had a sister, Tamar, who was very beautiful, and he wanted to have sexual relationships with her. And of course, it was not appropriate to have sex with your sister. So anyway, it's a long story, but he wound up raping his sister. And uh, then after he had humiliated her, he told her to leave. And she says, why? You've already humiliated me. It'd be better for you to marry me now than to turn me out like this. And anyway, it says that he, he hated her so that the hatred he had for her was greater than the love that he had for her. And this is something that you just need to learn, that any type of illicit sexual desire for a person is never God. It's not God's kind of love. It is earthly. It is sensual. It is devilish. It's inspired by the devil. And if you just step out of line the slightest way, they will turn on you in a heartbeat. There's some of you watching this program that you've, you've had a sexual relationship. You may be in a relationship, a marriage, or just a relationship with somebody right now, but it wasn't God that put it together. It was just nothing but lust. And you can verify what I'm saying, that it's not true love. God's kind of love overlooks a multitude of sins, covers a multitude of sins. But this earthly, sensual, devilish love Man, it is self-serving, self-seeking. The moment you don't get your way, you hate them. This woman who said that she loved Joseph so much, man, she hated him when he wouldn't submit to her, and she was willing to have him committed to prison. And she lied about him and did all of these things. I guarantee you, if you're having a relationship with anybody, and if it's just the flesh, if it's just lust, if it's not God's kind of love, it will not last and they'll turn on you the first time you get out of line. You can learn that right here. You can learn that through Amnon, what he did it with his wife Tamar, with his uh, sister Tamar. This is another lesson that you can learn. So she lied about him. And when Potiphar came home, we don't know if it just was at the end of the day or if he had been on a trip or something, but when he came home, it says in verse 17, she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried, which is an absolute lie. She was totally misrepresenting the whole thing, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant unto me, that his wrath was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into a prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Now there's a lot of detail that's left out. We don't know if Joseph was ever given an opportunity to uh, say what really happened. But you know, it's very possible that what good would it done? Was this master going to sit there and accuse his wife of lying about this whole thing? Uh, it's possible that there really was no purpose in even trying to defend himself. It's possible that he was never given an option to defend himself. But it's also possible that Joseph just depended upon God to defend him. You know, I've had some people lie about me. I've had some famous ministers that are on television and cut a large swath, and I mean, we're famous people, and I've had them brand me a cult and lie about me and say things. And you know what? I could have defended myself, but I just decided that, you know what? I don't know why they did what they did, and I just left it in God's hands. And it took about 15 or 20 years, but 20 years later, that exact ministry, and I had given money to them even after they branded me as a cult, they were in need and I sent money to them and I just went ahead and loved them and said nice things about them. I even ministered with them one time in a conference together and I didn't even criticize them or say anything to them about what they said. And about 15 or 20 years later, we were both going to be on TBN. We were both in the green room waiting on this and this person, this minister came to me and said, man, I just love your teaching. I watch you every day on television and they changed phone numbers with me, invited me to come if we ever needed to get away, that Jamie and I could come to their house and just spend some time away. And they just love me now. And I've been on their program and I've done things with them. I don't know what happened. They never did apologize. But you know what? God just defended me. And now we're friends. And uh, I don't know what happened. 
I STILL DON'T UNDERSTAND THAT WHOLE THING. BUT I KNOW THAT GOD PUT IT TOGETHER. I'VE HAD THIS HAPPEN WITH OTHER PEOPLE. ONE GUY WHO BRANDED ME A CULT, I WOUND UP COMING UP ON STAGE AND GRABBING ME BY THE FEET AND CRYING AND DROPPING HIS TEARS ON MY BOOT AND IN FRONT OF 700 PEOPLE APOLOGIZED FOR WHAT HE SAID. AND I NEVER, I DIDN'T EVEN KNOW HIM BEFORE THAT TIME. I NEVER CRITICIZED HIM. I NEVER RETALIATED. YOU KNOW, THE SCRIPTURE SAYS IN MANY PLACES, BUT uh, ROMANS CHAPTER 12, VENGEANCE IS MINE, THUS SAITH THE LORD. I WILL REPAY. AND YOU KNOW, IF YOU GET IN AND DEFEND YOURSELF, THEN YOU TAKE AWAY GOD DEFENDING YOU. BUT IF YOU'LL JUST LEAVE THINGS UP TO GOD. NOW, THERE MAY BE SOME TIME THAT IF SOMEBODY WAS CRITICIZING ME FOR THE GOSPEL AND CRITICIZING MY DOCTRINE, I MIGHT STAND UP AND DEFEND THE DOCTRINE. I HAVE DONE THAT AND I WILL DO THAT. BUT IF SOMEBODY'S JUST ATTACKING ME AND LYING ABOUT ME, THAT'S NOT THAT IMPORTANT OF A DEAL. AND I'VE USED THIS EXAMPLE BEFORE, AND SOME OF YOU HAVE HEARD IT, BUT IT'S A GREAT EXAMPLE THAT WHEN I WAS STILL IN THE BAPTIST CHURCH AND I WAS PREACHING THINGS THAT WEREN'T BAPTIST DOCTRINE, I WAS BEING CRITICIZED AND PEOPLE JUST WERE RAILING ON ME ALL OF THE TIME. AND I WENT TO A MEETING AND A MAN CALLED ME OUT AND HE SAID, I SEE YOU LIKE A RUNNER ON A TRACK, ONE OF THESE OVAL TRACKS, QUARTER OF A MILE TRACK. AND HE SAID, I SEE YOU RUNNING ON THIS TRACK. AND HE SAID, YOU'RE LEADING THE RACE. AND YET THE PEOPLE IN THE GRANDSTANDS ARE YELLING AT YOU AND TELLING YOU YOU'RE DOING IT ALL WRONG. AND I SEE YOU GETTING OFF OF THE TRACK AND GOING UP INTO THE GRANDSTANDS TO ARGUE WITH THE SPECTATORS. AND HE SAID, EVEN IF YOU WIN THE ARGUMENT, YOU'RE GOING TO LOSE THE RACE. AND THEN HE SAID, THUS SAITH THE LORD, YOU STAY ON TRACK, STAY ON TRACK. AND THAT HAS JUST BECOME, AGAIN, ONE OF THE MAIN THINGS IN MY LIFE. THAT IF A PERSON IS GOING TO ATTACK MY DOCTRINE, I'LL STAND UP FOR THE WORD OF GOD AND I'LL SPEAK THE WORD AND I'LL COUNTER FALSE DOCTRINE. BUT IF IT'S A PERSONAL ATTACK, I don't, I'M NOT GOING TO GET INTO THE GRANDSTANDS. EVEN IF I WIN THE ARGUMENT, I'M GOING TO LOSE THE RACE. SATAN IS GOING TO WIN IF I START SPENDING MY TIME DEFENDING MYSELF. SO I SAY ALL OF THIS TO SAY THAT THIS MAY BE WHAT HAPPENED WITH JOSEPH. WE DON'T HAVE THAT MUCH DETAIL HERE IN SCRIPTURE. WHETHER HE JUST NEVER DEFENDED HIMSELF AND HE LEFT IT UP TO GOD, WHETHER HE WAS NEVER GIVEN AN OPPORTUNITY TO DEFEND HIMSELF, WE DON'T KNOW EXACTLY WHAT HAPPENED. BUT NONETHELESS, HE WAS UNJUSTLY TAKEN FROM THIS POSITION THAT HE HAD EARNED IN POTIPHAR'S HOUSE TO WHERE HE WAS VERY, VERY SUCCESSFUL AND HE WAS JUST DOING THINGS RIGHT. POTIPHAR RESPECTED HIM. THE OTHER PEOPLE RESPECTED HIM. AND YET HE WAS LIED ABOUT AND HERE HE GOES DOWN INTO PRISON. AND THE PRISONS IN THOSE DAYS WERE NOT LIKE OUR PRISONS TODAY, WHERE PEOPLE HAVE THEIR OWN FLAT SCREEN TV AND, YOU KNOW, GOURMET MEALS AND THEY GET TO GO OUT IN THE YARD AND EXERCISE. I MEAN, THAT'S STILL PRISON, BUT MAN, uh, THIS WASN'T THAT KIND OF A PRISON. THIS WAS A uh, BAD SITUATION AND IT WAS UNJUST. IT WAS UNJUST THAT HE HAD BEEN HATED BY HIS BROTHERS. HIS FATHER CALLS THAT, NOT JOSEPH. THEN IT WAS UNJUST THAT HIS BROTHERS TRIED TO KILL HIM. AND THEN IT WAS UNJUST THAT HIS BROTHERS SOLD HIM INTO SLAVERY. AND YET HE STAYED FAITHFUL THROUGH ALL THOSE THINGS. NOW HERE HE IS UNJUSTLY ACCUSED WHEN HE WAS ABSOLUTELY, HAD NOTHING BUT INTEGRITY IN THIS SITUATION. YOU KNOW, IF YOU, if you SUFFER BECAUSE YOU'VE DONE SOMETHING WRONG, THAT'S ONE THING. BUT WHEN YOU'VE DONE THE RIGHT THING, AND YOU SUFFER, THAT'S HARDER TO BEAR. AND THERE'S A LOT OF PEOPLE THAT WOULD PUT UP WITH SHAME, SUFFERING, CRITICISM, DEMOTION OR SOMETHING IF IT WAS SOMETHING THAT YOU DESERVED. BUT WHEN YOU KNOW THAT YOU DESERVE BETTER, THAT'S HARDER TO TAKE. BUT IF JOSEPH WOULD HAVE GOTTEN IN TO BITTERNESS, IF HE WOULD HAVE SAID IT'S NOT FAIR, IF HE WOULD HAVE BEEN GRIPING AND COMPLAINING, HE NEVER WOULD HAVE COME OUT OF THAT PRISON. AND LIKEWISE, YOU AREN'T GOING TO COME OUT OF YOUR PRISON IF YOU SIT THERE AND LET CIRCUMSTANCES MAKE YOU BITTER. BOY, THIS IS IMPORTANT WHAT I'M SAYING. THESE THINGS THAT HAPPENED TO JOSEPH WERE NOT HIS FAULT. HE DID NOT BRING THIS UPON HIMSELF. AND YET, HE STILL HAD A GOOD ATTITUDE THROUGH ALL OF THESE NEGATIVE THINGS THAT HAPPENED. THERE'S SOME PEOPLE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM THAT MAYBE YOU'VE BEEN TREATED UNJUSTLY. MAYBE PEOPLE HAVE LIED ABOUT YOU AND BECAUSE OF IT, YOU FEEL JUSTIFIED IN BEING ANGRY AND BITTER AND HAVING UNFORGIVENESS. BUT MANY OF YOU HAVE HEARD THIS SAYING BEFORE THAT WHEN YOU HAVE UNFORGIVENESS TOWARDS SOMEBODY, THAT'S LIKE YOU DRINKING POISON THINKING IT'S GOING TO HURT THEM. 
Unforgiveness hurts you worse than the person that you will not forgive. That person that did you wrong has probably gone on and forgotten about you. But here you are still nurturing that thing and that unforgiveness. You got to get past it. Man, Jesus said that you've got to forgive. If you don't forgive, your heavenly Father won't forgive you. If you have been forgiven this huge debt that there is no way you could have ever paid it, and yet somebody else has done something to you comparative to what God has forgiven you over, it is nothing in comparison. You've got to forgive. You've got to get past this. And again, I know that God is speaking directly to somebody through me today that you need to get over this. Joseph could have gone down into prison and just said, what's the use? I've stayed faithful to God even after being hated by my brothers, sold into slavery, put into, uh, you know, a person's house, and then the master's wife um, lied about me, and all of this is unjust. They could have just given up and said, what's the use? But you know what? He had a vision, and he never let go of that vision. He never gave up on the fact that God had showed him someday he would be exalted and his brother and father would come and bow down to him. You got to hold on to what God has told you and don't let what other people have done to you make you bitter. You always have a choice whether you become bitter or better. I don't care how bad things are going. And man, you can learn this through Joseph. What a great example of a guy who ha has put up with more problems, more bad stuff happening to him than have happened to any of you watching this program. And if Joseph did it, you can do it. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm now into my second week of teaching through uh, the life of Joseph and just gleaning things from him. I've got this little booklet that is an introduction to my lessons from Joseph. We're offering this as a free gift. And then I've got this brand new book, first time we've ever put this out, Lessons from Joseph. It's a 200-page book, and we have a suggested donation, but we'll send this to you if you'll just send anything for this. I want to get this truth out. I also have CDs and DVDs and a USB that were taken from my television program. And I encourage you to please get this. Joseph is one of the greatest characters in the Bible and I, he has impacted me big time. These scriptures that we've been sharing are some of the foundational things that God showed me. I, I got these things as a young man and it has kept me from making some serious mistakes. And even if you've already gone through some things, I guarantee you there's things that you can learn from Joseph that would just be huge in your life. So we've already covered a lot of material. Again, please get the uh, materials that we're offering to get the full impact of this. But we've now talked about how that Joseph uh, was sold into slavery, and even in slavery he had a great attitude. He served his master, and because of it he was promoted over the entire household of Potiphar, and Potiphar didn't even know anything that belonged to him, nothing that was done except just the food that he ate. That's how much trust he put in Joseph, which says volumes about what kind of person Joseph was. But then the master's wife tried to seduce Joseph. He wouldn't do it, and she forced him, tried to force him, and he fled and left his coat in the house, and so she kept it, and when her master came home, she lied about him and said he came in and tried to force her have sexual relations, and when she screamed that Joseph departed and left his coat, and that was all a lie, and nonetheless, uh, the master went ahead and got mad and put Joseph in prison. So that's what we've already covered, and it says here in 
Genesis chapter 39 and in verse 20, it says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But look at this. This, this just amazes me again in verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now, again, most people would think that if you had been faithful, let's just, we don't know the exact amount of time, but let's say for five or six years, could have been 10 years, that Joseph had served Potiphar, had been faithful because of it, he was promoted, and yet here's Potiphar's wife that lies about him, and he gets thrown into prison. Most people would be sucking their thumb, talking about how bad everything is, bitter, angry, upset, and most people would look at it and think, God, where are you? Why have you deserted me? Why have you let these things happen? See, that's when you're looking at things just in physical terms and circumstances. But the scripture says that the Lord was with Joseph. Man, that's awesome. Many people, there are people watching this program right now that you think God has left me because you're sick and you haven't seemed to get your healing. You're poor. You haven't been able to break out of things. Maybe somebody has divorced you and left you. Your kids have turned on you. Uh, you aren't being promoted. You're being passed over at work and other people are being promoted. And you're just looking at circumstances and you're letting circumstances tell you that God's not with you. God's not blessing you. The blessing of God's not on you. But I tell you, if you're born again, it says in Ephesians 1, 3, you're already blessed with all spiritual blessings, that God has commanded the blessing upon you out of Deuteronomy chapter 28 and on and on it goes. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter what things look like in the natural. If you are called of God, if you are following God, the blessing of God is on you and those negative circumstances around you are all subject to change. You know, this is how Paul said he was able to deal with his hardships. He was beaten. He was put in prison. He was stoned and left for dead. He was beaten with rods. Uh, he had terrible things happen to him. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, it's all a light affliction. How could he say it was a light affliction when everything in his circumstances, he was treated worse than any of us have ever been treated? How could he say that? He goes on to say, because our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, which are temporal, but the things which are not seen, which are eternal. You know how he was able to endure and make it just a light affliction? Not because there wasn't many problems. It was because of the way he processed it. He looked at things and put it into the proper perspective. And he says it's just a light affliction because he wasn't looking at what was seen. He was looking at what wasn't seen. You know, in my life, I've already used some of these examples, but the Lord showed me in 1968 that he wanted me to minister to people all over the world. And yet for probably six years to 10 years, there was little to no evidence of it in my life or ministry. Things were not working out right. But did you know what I did? I, I wasn't looking at what I could see with my eyes. I was looking with my heart. And every time I was in relationship with God, He would just tell me, it's going to be different. You're going to make it. You're going to do this. And you have to get to where you see things with your heart. You see the way that God sees. Here was Joseph put into prison. And I guarantee you, those prisons of that day were not like our prisons today where people have a flat screen TV and all of these kind of things. This was a bad situation. And yet Joseph, God was still with him and Joseph knew it. Now, some people might think, how do you know that he didn't get bitter and go through all of this? Because of the way he acted. Look at this. Let me just keep reading. It says in verse 22, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not on anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and uh, that which he did, the Lord made to prosper. You know why I can tell that, that Joseph didn't just sit there and get depressed and defeated and bitter 
because you don't promote people like that. This goes way back to the same thing I said in the earlier part of this chapter that when he was sold into slavery and it says Joseph was a prosperous man, standing there naked, being sold into slavery, and yet God saw him as prosperous, and Joseph still saw himself as prosperous, and you can prove it because he began to serve his master and he was promoted, and the master saw that God was with him. You don't see God with people who are sitting there depressed and defeated. And so now here's another situation where he's put in prison, but it says that the Lord was with him and Joseph knew that the Lord was with him and he lived like he believed that God's anointing was still on him. He believed that God was still going to bring those visions that he had had those dreams to pass. And you can prove it because the keeper of the prison saw the blessing of God on him. You don't see the blessing of God on people that are just sitting there griping, angry, bitter, complaining, talking about I'm a minority and nobody's treating me right and just blaming everybody else. Joseph was living a life that showed he still had faith in God. And because of it, the keeper of the prison put everything under his hand, just like Potiphar. He didn't even know what was going on. You know, we don't know exactly about the Egyptians, but in the Roman days, we know for sure that in Rome, if a prisoner escaped, the jailer was held accountable for that and was put to death. These people, their life was on the line. You can see that clearly in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, because when the earthquake came and all the prison doors were open and the chains fell off, the jailer was going to kill himself because he was going to be killed by the Romans, and he would rather kill himself than be tortured and killed by the Romans. And yet Paul yelled out, don't do yourself any harm. And the jailer came in and he got saved in his whole house. So in Roman days, that's the way it was. I suspect that, that that's the way it was here. But even if it wasn't like his life was on the line, I can guarantee you he would have been punished big time if something went wrong in this prison. And yet here is the guy responsible for all of the prisoners turning everything over to Joseph so that he doesn't even know what's going on. At the very least, he would have been punished big time. He could have been put into prison. At the very worst, his life could have been on the line. This shows you how much honor and trust and respect he had for Joseph. You don't put that kind of trust in a person who's sitting there just licking his wounds and griping and complaining and blaming everybody else and bitter at God because of the way his life was going. So the reaction of the jailer right here says volumes about Joseph once again. Here he is, years. You know, it was a total of 13 years from the time he had the dreams until he stood before Pharaoh and saw something good happen. There was two years after he interpreted the dreams of the baker and the butler in uh, prison. And so it had to be a minimum of, uh, well, it was a maximum of 12, 11 years uh, when at this time that this happened, it could have been more than that. But he was at least a decade into being sold into slavery and all of these things. And here he is still after a decade, there wasn't any positive results. Everything looks bad, and yet he's still got a great attitude. And look at this as it goes into the 40th chapter. This is one of the most amazing things about Joseph. Right here, it says in chapter 40, verse 1, it says, It came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt, and Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers, against the chief of the bakers, and he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. And they continued a season in ward. Now here again, see, is Joseph in a situation where most people who had been through what he had been through, they would be thinking only about themselves. And they'd be thinking, it's not fair. And they'd just be thinking, what can I do to take care of myself? Joseph is here serving two people who were put in prison. We don't know why they were put in prison, but you know, in those days, it didn't have to necessarily be something big. It could just be the whim of the person who was the dictator. But nonetheless, Joseph was serving them and not just thinking about himself. Here he was taking his position as low as it was in prison, and he was serving the people that were under his charge. And look at this. 
it says in verse 5, it says, And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked on them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were in the ward of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? This just amazes me. These people were in prison, and I made this point already, but this wasn't the kind of prisons we have today. This was bad. They had been demoted, put into prison. They could have been facing life in prison or death. And Joseph comes up and says, Why are you sad today? The fact that it was unusual for them to be sad says a lot about Joseph. It says in the previous verse that Joseph was serving them. I believe that this chief butler and baker were probably being treated better in prison under Joseph's ministry than they had ever been treated, treat, treated outside of prison under Pharaoh and living for him. They were blessed. It was unusual for them to be sad. You know, you could go into most prisons today, and I guarantee you, you wouldn't go up to the prisoners and say, why are you sad today? People would think you're crazy. Well, it was because I'm in prison. But in Joseph's prison, it was unusual to see a sad person because Joseph ministered to them. They probably were freer, more loved, more cared for in prison than they had ever been outside. Again, you have to think about things like this, but this says volumes. People in Joseph's prison were happy. People in Joseph's prison, even though there was bad things going on in their life, they were probably being treated better than they had ever been treated before. So again, this shows us that Joseph was not their bitter. Bitter people don't make other people around them happy. Uh, people that are griping and complaining and murmurs and just have a negative outlook on life and bitter at God, like, God, why did you let this happen? Uh, the people around them are not happy people. Man, this is one reason that Joseph, he was just like a cork. You take him to the bottom of the lake and he's going to rise again because he just had this attitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. There's a lot of people that don't understand that. They're praying for promotion. But why would God promote you? You know, I actually was in Phoenix one time and I was ministering in a church and they had a driver that picked me up from my hotel and drove me back and forth to all of the things. And anyway, this driver... I tried to engage him in conversation and he wouldn't hardly talk to me. He would just answer a question directly, but he wouldn't carry on a conversation. And after two or three times driving like this, the guy was just bitter. The guy was angry. You could tell. And finally, uh, towards the end of the time I was there, I just got this driver and I said, look, what's going on with you? I said, it is obvious that you are hurt. You're bitter about something. And I said, what's happened with you? And this guy just began to like throw up on me, all of his hurt and all of his pain. And he was saying that he came to that church because he's called to the ministry and he's serving in that church and he wants an opportunity to minister. And yet everybody else is getting opportunities to minister, but nobody's giving him an opportunity. And so he was bitter. And I mean, he was angry and just spewing out all of this stuff. And you know how I ministered to him? I said, I wonder why they don't want to promote this attitude that you've expressed to me, your anger, your bitterness. I said, why would they not want to put that in front of people? And boy, it just was like a slap in the face. This guy all of a sudden realized he didn't realize how bitter he had become. And no wonder they hadn't promoted him because he had a wrong attitude. You don't promote people like that. There's people watching this program right now that you may not have realized it, but you're bitter, you're angry, you're thinking it's not fair, and you're sitting there and you're just, you're just letting all of this venom flow out of you and wondering why things aren't working, why nobody promotes you, why you don't have any friends. It's because you're just full of stickers and briars. Anybody that gets close to you gets all of this junk that's on the inside of you. I'm not saying these things to hurt you, I'm saying it to help you. And Jesus is the answer for all of this. In the same way that the Lord was with Joseph and even in a very bad situation where he was in prison, he was ministering to people 
and blessing them so that it was unusual to see a person who was sad. You can do that. If Joseph could do that after all of the things that had happened to him, you can certainly get above the things that have happened to you. You need to let go of your unforgiveness, your bitterness. You need to go to the Lord. You need to get a word from God about what God wants to do in your life. And it's just like Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I think it's the NIV says to give you a hope in the future. God's plans for you are good. He's never made anybody to be a failure. If you're in a tight situation, if you're in a bad situation and it looks like there's no way out, I can guarantee you God's got a way out. God has better plans for you, but you got to quit doing your own thing. That's probably what got you into the situation you're in. Or sometimes, just like Joseph, it's not what you do, it's what other people do to you. But nonetheless, God has a way out of the mess you're in to a better place. But you aren't going to find it if you're sitting there with unforgiveness, bitterness, if you've got this venom flowing through you. It says in James chapter 3, verse 16, it says, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. If you get into envy and strife, you let in confusion, which the Bible says confusion is not of God. God's the author of peace, as in all the churches of the Lord. So you let in the devil and every evil work. You just allow the devil. It's like throwing your arms open wide and saying, Satan, just shoot your best shot. Do whatever you want. Many of you don't like what I'm saying. It doesn't fit the way you're thinking. You're feeling justified and somehow or another you think that it's helping you to be bitter and angry and having unforgiveness, but it's not helping you at all. If you ever expect to get out of prison, you got to go through this thing and out the other side. You can't sit there and let it dominate you. Man, this is God speaking to people. You know, we got a phone center and there are people on the phones right now. 24-7, you can call and you need, to, you need to repent to God, yes, but you need to repent to people. You could call and get these materials and stuff, and I promise you that this would help you. But you need to learn a lesson here. He was shocked to find them sad because they had been happier in prison than they had been before. And it, here's what it goes on to say in verse 8. It says, They said unto him, We have dreamed a dream and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray thee. So Joseph here said, instead of just dealing with things in the natural realm, he says God can interpret a dream. He was believing that God could do things through him that were beyond just normal, natural things. You know, I'm running short of time on today's program, but when I get into these dreams, you'll find out that really, uh, the interpretation that Joseph gave, it wasn't obvious. This really was a revelation from God. I believe that Joseph had a supernatural gift. That's the reason that God started his ministry to Joseph in the 37th chapter with two dreams. This was a, a gifting. You know, there's 15 times in the Bible that God spoke specifically through dreams. I'm not going to go through every one of them, but many of them are right here. Joseph had two of them. Here's the two with the butler and the baker. Pharaoh had two dreams. So that's six dreams that were really significant in Joseph's life just in this situation. Uh, Joseph, not the Joseph here, but the Joseph that was the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, he had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Uh, and there's just a number of times God uses dreams. Not all dreams are from God, but God speaks through dreams. God speaks to me just about every week in a dream, some way or another. It may not be something spectacular, but just something that I'm thinking about, what should I do, and boom, right here is a dream. I've been getting dreams since I was a little kid. And so there's some people that God speaks to through dreams. God has a supernatural way of empowering you to come out of the situation you're in. It may not be the interpretation of dreams, but there is a supernatural answer to whatever problem you're dealing with. And so Joseph just said, well, tell me the dreams. And he believed that God was going to use him and give him an interpretation. So I hadn't got time today. Let me just summarize and say that, that the, um, it was the um, butler 
told him his dream, and the interpretation was very good about how in three days he would be restored unto his butlership. And so when the baker saw that he had a positive interpretation, he decided, I'll tell you my dream too. But the interpretation of the baker's dream was just the opposite. In three days, he'd be hung on a tree and have his head cut off. <laughs> so uh, Joseph, you can see another thing about Joseph, that Joseph said that these people were sad. That was unusual, but he told people the truth. He didn't sugarcoat anything. He said it exactly the way it was. And if you're going to truly be used of God, you got to get to where you won't compromise the message just in order to make people feel good. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm in the middle of my second week teaching about the life of Joseph. And I've got this little booklet that I've written. This is an introduction to this larger teaching. This is a 200-page book through the life of Joseph. And I tell you, this, these are some of the things that are like foundational truths in my life. And, and Joseph is just such a tremendous example. Uh, it has blessed me. And I promise you, one of the reasons that so many people are having trouble today is because they don't take heed to the things that are written in Scripture. And it says over in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 11, that these things were written so that we could learn through these people what to do and what not to do. And Joseph is just one of the greatest examples. Some of the most foundational things that God has ever taught me came through the life of Joseph. And I promise you, this teaching would help you. This is a brand new book. We've never released this before. First time I've ever offered it. And this is a 200-page book. We're asking for a donation of any amount on that. And then this is our freebie giveaway. It's a brief summary. And we have CDs, DVDs, and a USB also. We're now into... Genesis chapter 40, and I'm aware that not everybody is familiar with the whole story of Joseph. I just can't go back through everything, but Joseph was the favorite son of his father, and because of that, it caused problems with the brothers. The brothers hated him. God gave Joseph two dreams that put a vision, a hope on the inside of him about what his future was going to be, that he would be exalted and that people would come and bow down to him. And so uh, I made a big point of that, that you need to have a purpose, a vision for your life because there will be hardship in between where you are and where God wants you to go. And during the time uh, in between those dreams and when Joseph finally saw some of those dreams coming to pass, there was 13 years of nothing but hardship. His brothers tried to kill him, eventually wound up selling him into slavery. And even in slavery, he held on to God. God was with him. He prospered, became the uh, chief servant in Potiphar's house so that Potiphar didn't even know anything that was going on except the food that he ate. You don't give that to people with a bad attitude. That shows you that, that Joseph was seeking God, had a great attitude through this whole thing. But even as he prospered in Potiphar's house as the chief slave over everything, then Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him and because he rebuffed her, she lied about him, got him put into prison and so here he is for probably a decade into being rejected by his brothers, sold into slavery. Here he is in prison. Most people would have given up, and yet Joseph still had a great attitude, was serving the people in the prison so much so that when somebody was sad, it was unusual. People in prison, it was unusual for them to be sad. <laughs> that says a lot about Joseph. And so two of the people that were in the prison were the chief butler and the chief baker. And they both dreamed a dream in one night, and they were perplexed by this dream. And so Joseph told them, says, you know, uh, interpretation of dreams belongs to God. Tell me the dream, and I believe that God will give you an answer. So that's where we are. And in Genesis chapter 40, verse 9, it says, The chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup 
into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. And look at this in verse uh, 14. But think of me when it be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that should uh, put me into the dungeon. Now this is the only time in all of the things written about Joseph that he ever mentioned anything about asking somebody to remember him and mention him to Pharaoh and that it was unjust what was done to him. Again, by his actions, I think his actions speak louder than anything else. His actions show that his attitude was correct. And this is a point that I've made throughout this thing, that your altitude, how high you go, really depends on your attitude. And there's a lot of people that have a bad attitude and yet they want to be promoted. It doesn't work that way. So this is the closest thing to a gripe that you can hear from Joseph. And really, the way I look at it, this isn't a gripe. It's just he was mentioning to a person who had an opportunity to do him good. He had done good to him by interpreting his dream and helping him. And then he says, when you get back into this place, mention me to Pharaoh. So that's the only time that he's ever said anything like that in this whole account. When the baker saw that the interpretation was good, it's in verse uh, 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was of all manner of bakements for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. This is amazing. You know, there was two dreams. They both came in the same night. They definitely were from God because the interpretation, everything came to pass. These weren't just pizza dreams. These were dreams that came from God. And the first dream was a positive interpretation. The second dream was certainly a negative interpretation. Within three days, you're going to have your head cut off and you're going to be hung on a tree. And one of the things I get from this is that Joseph, even though he ministered to these people and it was unusual for them to be sad, he was a faithful minister of the Lord. And when God told him something, even if it was negative, he went ahead and shared it. You know, this is something that we see not happening in our day. There are so many ministers that are trying to please everybody. It's what the Bible calls teachers having itching ears. They're wanting somebody to tickle their ears and just compliment them and say things to them. There are ministers today that will not speak the truth. I actually talked to one guy who he was asking me questions about healing and I told him one of the reasons, I didn't say it's the only reason, but one of the reasons that people don't receive healing is because they just don't believe. And I went on to say that's not the only reason. You could also have unbelief. There could be the faith of the other person and just multiple things, and we discussed it. But when I told him this and I said that one of the reasons is that people just don't believe, and if you don't receive, you won't, you don't believe, you don't, won't receive. When I said that, this pastor of a mega church said, I would never tell anybody that. I would never say it's because your faith isn't good. Now, see, that's not right because that is true. And matter of fact, on that Sunday, I went to his church and he read the passage of Scripture from Matthew chapter 17 about how that the man that had the demon-possessed boy that, you know, had convulsions brought him to the disciples and they couldn't cast him out. And Jesus said unto them, O faithless and perverse generation, how long am I going to be with you? How long will I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And this pastor read that passage where Jesus said, you are faithless and perverse. And yet this pastor said, I would never tell a person that their faith isn't the way that it should be. Well, obviously he did not represent God correctly. And because of it, he's compromised on some things. And he's a brother. I love him. I don't hate him, but I guarantee you, he will not stand up on certain things. And it's not right. There's a lot of people like that that just will not tell a person the truth. You know, there was a guy that came to me one time and was asking me about why are these things happening? And as he was telling me his situation, 
the Lord spoke to me real clearly and said, this guy is the problem. And he showed me what the problem was and showed me something this guy was doing that was causing all of these problems. And so as this guy was talking to me, I was hearing from the Lord. And I remember thinking, God, if I tell him this, he's not going to like it. He may not receive it. Should I tell him this? And as I was debating whether I would tell him what God had shown me, the Lord spoke to me and he says, you do not have the right to reject the truth for that guy. If you tell him the truth, if you tell him what I told you and he rejects it, well, then that's one thing, but you don't have the right to do it for him. If you sit there and censor what I'm telling you because you're afraid somebody might reject it, then you aren't truly reflecting God. So this is one of the things, see, that I see from Joseph is that Joseph told the truth. And even when it was bad, he was prophesying to this guy, in three days, you're going to die. He'll cut your head off and hang you on a tree and birds are going to eat the flesh off of you. That's not something that's edifying, but it was the truth. And it came to pass just exactly the way that he prophesied. So let's continue to read that. And it says in verse 20, and it came to pass the third day which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all of his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. But look at this in verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Again, here's another insult. Joseph had been rejected by his brothers. They threatened to kill him, sold him into slavery. So he endured that rejection and that hardship. And yet he kept a good attitude and served Potiphar. And I mean, he served Potiphar better than anybody had ever served Potiphar. And yet because of Potiphar's wife hating him, he was lied against and rejected again. And this time he was put in prison. So this time he was ministering to these people instead of sitting there crying in his situation and just complaining. He was ministering to people. He was being faithful. He spoke to a man, gave him a prophecy that came to pass. And this man went from the dungeon into being back in Pharaoh's presence. You would think that this guy would be so appreciative of Joseph that he would have done what Joseph asked. Joseph asked him, to remember him and mention him in a favorable way unto uh, Pharaoh. And yet he didn't do it. He goes on to say in the last verse, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. You know, how much, how much negative can a person endure? There are probably people watching this program right now that you've had negative things happen to you and you just, you might've been okay for a little period of time, but now you feel totally justified in just giving up, quitting, because look at all that's happened to me. I doubt seriously that anybody has gone through as much suffering and as much rejection and unjust punishment as what Joseph did. And yet Joseph kept his attitude right. If Joseph did it, you can do it. That's one of the things that I get out of studying scripture. When you see people who did these great feats like David killed Goliath and he was just a little kid, maybe 17 years old. And that gives me encouragement. that praise God, I can slay the giants that are facing me. When you see people that do all of these things, Moses, how he stood up to the mightiest nation on the planet and without a, you know, a, a sword, without a bow and arrow, without any weapons, he defeated the mightiest nation on the face of the earth. If, if Moses did that, I can do it. If Joseph did this, I can do it. I know I'm speaking to some people that you just feel overwhelmed by things, but I'm telling you, if Joseph did it, if these other people did it, if I've done it, you can do it. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. This is one of the passages out of 1 Samuel chapter 30 that really ministers to me because after 13 years of David being anointed to be king, he had already slain Goliath, but the king Saul hated him and pursued him, tried to kill him. And he had been running for 13 years, living in caves. He had his wife taken away from him by his father-in-law, King Saul, and given to another man just to spite him. And after all of these things, 
He was living in a foreign country because he couldn't live in the nation of Israel because Saul would hunt him and kill him. He was living in a foreign country. He had the Amalekites invade his village and take all of the women and the children captive and burnt all of the uh, houses. And after all of these things, for 13 years, it says that David and the men that were with him